So welcome everyone to our tutorial this afternoon on software practices for better science, testing, reproducibility, and documentation. And uh, I'm going to give a short introduction and then we'll uh, start the tutorial. We are recording obviously so that people can uh, catch up if they're late to join or have interruptions during the session. Um, and I just wanna call out this uh, URL that's on the slide. This is our tutorial website. Um, all of our tutorials have, each has a page there and you can go there and find um, the page for today's tutorial and get um, all copies of the all the presentations, uh, links to the other, uh, to the resources we mentioned in the presentations and things like that. I will, um, I'll come back to this slide in a minute. Uh, your presenters today are myself, David Bernholt from um, Oak Ridge National Lab. Actually, all three of us today, as it happens, are from Oak Ridge National Labs. Also, David Rogers and Greg Watson. We're all members of the Ideas Productivity Project, which is part of the ECP. Uh, and the Ideas team works with the ECP community and beyond to improve developer productivity, software sustainability, uh, because these are really important aspects to uh, scientific progress and scientific productivity. And we use a variety of uh, approaches to do this work. There's a DOI in the bottom left to a report that we wrote a couple of years ago that sort of outlines how we approach our work. If you're interested in learning more about the various things we do, please uh, have a look there. But to point out a couple of specific things, one of the things that we're trying to do is to build a community of people who are aware of good software practices and who are sharing good software practices and things like that. And one of the ways that we're trying to do that is this site called bssw.io, Better Scientific Software. Um, this is a community resource. Anybody can contribute, and of course, anybody can read it. Um, this is a site that meant, you, uh, meant to help you find information on doing a better job with scientific software. And also, we'd love for you to contribute new resources to the site based on your experiences, things that you found useful. Um, in addition, if you're interested in following more of the activities that we organize, you can join the Ideas Productivity mailing list, which is at the first link up here. Um, and the BSSW site also has a monthly digest that highlights some of the new content that appears each month. Uh, these are both low activity lists, so you shouldn't be bombarded with things, but you might find them useful if you want to find out more about um, our HPC best practices webinar series, strategies for working remotely panel series, and events that we organize at various meetings like the upcoming SIAM CSE 23 meeting uh, that's being held in Amsterdam in a couple of weeks. Um, I just want to spend a moment talking about the importance of naming. Uh, computing is rife with terminology that many consider harmful and exclusionary. And in this tutorial, we're trying to do a better job and replace such uh, language with more inclusive language. So I don't think you'll see so much of it in this particular content, but we've, we've tried to um, change our language so that it's more inclusive. If you find anything, um, you like to bring to our attention that would further improve this aspect of our tutorial, please let us know. And then on the bottom uh, are a couple of links for more information if you're interested in finding out more about being more inclusive in the context of software development. Um, as I mentioned, the um, website, uh, once again, the URL is here. Every tutorial has a page, it has a variety of links and uh, can give um, information and this will be available after the tutorial as well. So you can always go back to it. Uh, we treat these pages as archival and um, so you can go back uh, and look at them at any time. And then I wanted to take a moment to explain uh, slide two, which I skipped over initially. This slide, slide two and all of our presentations 
is contains uh, a license for um, sharing and reusing the content, it includes a requested citation if you for some reason want to uh, cite this work to others, uh, and it includes our acknowledgement. And the most important of these is uh, to acknowledge our sponsors, the Exascale Computing Project. And this is one example of software best practices. Uh, that we're just starting out with right away. One is to make your license and your preferred citation easily findable, uh, and also acknowledging your sponsors rarely hurts. So um, we want to interact with you during this tutorial and after this tutorial, so um, please feel free to use the chat. Um, this is going to be a, a pretty informal session, and I think we'll have time for questions and answers um, that we can handle verbally. So we might ask you uh, at times to unmute as well, if you prefer that. Um, uh, we also are available after the chat uh, at this uh, email address that's listed there. And of course, you can go back to the uh, GitHub page once we have processed the recording and posted it. Uh, this, the recording will be up there linked to this particular uh, events page. I also wanted to mention uh, this week is the ECP tutorial days. Next week are the ECP community BOF days. And if you're interested in the kinds of things you're hearing in this tutorial, there are a couple of events then that might also interest you. One is about the BSSW.io site, so you can learn more about that. And the other is about the BSSW uh, fellowship, and you can learn more about that. Um, more, uh, uh, these links can also be found with all the other links in our tutorial uh, on the website, on the web page for this tutorial. So you can go there as well. Today, what we're going to cover is um, software testing and verification. We're going to have a break that's a little bit earlier than what was in Yazi's table, um, so that we're not breaking up a, a presentation in the middle. And then we're going to talk about uh, reproducibility. And we're going to talk about lab notebooks. And as I said, we welcome your questions and comments through the chat. And as we have time, uh, we'll, we'll, we can do it uh, verbally as well. And with that, I'm going to hand over to David Rogers, and uh, he can start the first presentation. You're muted, David. You said the mute button. Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay, so there you go. Now everyone should be able to see my slides. Yep. Great. Um, today I'm going to talk about testing strategies, and this is a combined tutorial that does both our, our introduction to testing and our advanced testing and um, information on getting a, a continuous integration pipeline set up. Um, I'm, as you mentioned before, I'm David Rogers from Oak Ridge National Lab and a, members of the, a member of the IDEA's ECP project. This is our license slide. Um, on testing, I'll go over some general guidelines and, and information on how to create a comprehensive set of tests for your code. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about bugs, documentations, and interactions on issues as, as kind of the um, the place that you go when your tests fail or when you have issues with, with upstream software. And then I'll conclude with uh, four different examples of, of increasingly difficult development of testing for software stacks. And of course, after testing is done, we'll go into CI. So imagine that you, you've written some software and you're at a place where your, your team is starting to interact with the software and new users are coming on and new developers are coming into your project. And you realize that you need to have uh, a good set of tests so that your, your project is able to continue to bring in community contributions, um, but also get current developers to, to always have a working and stable set of, of um, software functionality. You can think about this problem of building your test suite as selecting the right tests, uh, trying to find a good mixture of, of tests at different levels that can be um, 
automated or scheduled testing to do long running and comprehensive coverage of how your your software is built and run and and does in, in performance critical situations but also um, tests that are tests that are fast running and are used for quickly diagnosing errors you can also break up your tests in terms of test granularity which is a concept that asks how small of a unit of code is your test uh, actually looking at so unit tests are are a level of granularity that can isolate an individual component of your software and look at and look at whether or not one function or one class or one file or module is working correctly integration tests are as you build up in complexity of your software stack and your modules import each other and you import upstream um, the upstream is, is what I refer to as dependencies that are other projects that your project depends on so a library or, or another application that that you're using as part of your run um, and then restart tests or kind of cold start tests are where you you start from scratch and you build everything and you run it um, you want to have a test suite that kind of addresses all of these different modes uh, of testing and as a rule of thumb you also want to be able to um, write your tests so that they're as simple as possible that way you don't spend time diagnosing what's wrong with the test you spend your time diagnosing what's wrong with your source code um, and also a test that easily that, that's easily traceable to the exact part of the code that went wrong um, so you want to write your tests so that if it fails you've learned something about what's causing the the failure of your code and there's a, a link to some useful resources here you might ask yourself why not always just build a, a test that tests absolutely everything and and you know go go all out and make every possible test out there um it's important to trade off the time that you spend building your tests with the the time that you spend you know developing your application and putting in new functionality so if you're um so so if you're trying to test everything it, it might actually be become a time sink and become counterproductive um Ideally, tests are closely aligned to the science objectives for a single domain code. Um, in this case, the tests themselves can provide you some baselines. Um, they can give you information on, um, they can give you baselines of, of how your code is running and um, example use cases. In fact, there are some examples that I'll show later on uh, in this talk where um, teams like, teams have gone out and um, they've created a test that actually imports and runs the examples that are present in their documentation which is great because now you're you're eliminating code duplication um, if testing goes too far then um, it can distract your project away from achieving its its great features um, on the other hand if you don't put enough testing in you can actually um, get a false sense of security from thinking that your tests are passing but not actually testing some uh, critical parts so defects can slip through so you have this trade-off between kind of how much testing you're doing and how much effort you're spending on them um, okay so i'm going to go through this example here on you know why not the most stringent testing um, in this example we're looking at say testing whether or not a halo exchange is working between two mpi ranks um, that have that have a that have a set of information that's in red that's their local domain and the blue are the halo cells that are needed to do a local computation um, if we don't test the halo exchange is working then there's no way to know when the assumption that the halo exchange is working is breaking down um, and usually codes actually have some sort of finite range if this range becomes larger than the next rank or something then um, then there's a there's an extra difficulty that comes in and actually making this halo exchange work so there's usually assumptions of some sort built into halo exchanges and, and tests can help you make sure that those assumptions match what your code is actually doing uh, this line of thought actually leads you to the idea of um, you know the line of thought of, of getting the tests to test exactly what you need and, and not too much more um, and make sure that your your code use is in line with your testing it leads to the idea of having a team meeting that's focused specifically on creating a plan for your tests uh, the goal of that kind of meeting is to clearly map, map out how you expect your users to use your code that'll tell you what parts of your code are critical to long-term stability um, who on your team should be responsible for ensuring that each piece of your code is working and tested um, and you can strategize also about what kind of difficulties would come from interacting modules um, or how you might how your code might change in the future 
and also how these could be reasonably addressed with examples and use cases, right? So, so just spend some time drilling down on what kinds of tests and what modules you need to test. And this will leave you uh, hopefully feeling, uh, hopefully with the feeling that you know um, what your code is being used for and what are the critical pieces to test. Um, okay, so now everyone is on board with your testing plan and your code is in a good place. What happens next? Um, you can double check that your that your testing is good and double check your work with what's called a code coverage tool. Um, and I'll show an example of what that looks like later. You can create a policy on what to do with failed tests and issue um, and issues that are marked as bugs. Um, it helps to assign responsibility for for monitoring those issues, not necessarily for resolving them, but for at least monitoring and and making sure that that something is happening with those issues uh, to a person on your team. Um, that helps them to get credit uh, and recognition for the fact that they're you know watching what's happening with these tests in the release process um, and to kind of manage the community. Um, and it also makes sure that things don't things don't get dropped. You should consider um, your testing suite during refactorings because once you have it, it's actually really great to um, to be able to have tests now when you start making major changes to your code because it allows you to um, have a degree of confidence that things are still working the way they should be despite the fact that the code has changed a lot. Um, and I've actually found in, in my experience that the tests that I've built um, allow me to refactor a little bit more boldly than I would have without tests. Um, cost effectiveness also comes in with a test suite because if you already have well-defined functionalities and tests, it's much less likely that your team will get sidetracked later on um, maintaining maintaining releases that are in the past. So once you make a release, um, you've run all of your tests, you have a, a degree of assurance that everything is working as expected, um, and there's less, less long-term difficulty in keeping things working. All right, so having discussed at high level kind of how to strategize around tests and what kinds of tests to build, I also want to spend a little bit of time um, asking the question, how do I resolve issues that come up? New team members are, are probably the, the ones that are most exposed to this sort of, of question because they're essentially performing a cold start and um, they're going to encounter a lot of issues and be the first ones that, that are there to bring this up. Um, in my experience, the issues that new team members file are um, among the most valuable because they reveal weak points in delivering quality software. Um, with that in mind, I want to encourage everyone to think about adopting uh, a new code or a dependency as a process of testing. Uh, assume that, that missing and non-working documentation is a bug and report it, but also be mindful that um, we work inside of institutions and, and groups. So um, your HPC centers and collaborators and system administrators um, also have kind of a shared perspective with you as code users. They will be able to uh, track issues and they, they might have some idea of what's going wrong. And so they'll probably be able to help you write better bug reports and to, to track whether or not um, a given issue is is due to, is falling into the response, more into the responsibility of the the, developers of the code or your HPC center and the way that you're using it. Um, and so you can kind of partner with those people. If you've been able to get something working that wasn't trivial, this is also a great opportunity for building a, a ladder to others to do the same, uh, to do the same thing and get things working. Uh, so if you can contribute your findings back to the developers. Um, also, I want to note that a lot of codes document how to correctly install their dependencies as well. Uh, so, so in addition to contributing how to install things uh, for, for your own software, you can even write, um, you know, we use these specific options when we build the Boost library. Um, this is something that I've seen the Pick and GPU team do. It's really helpful because now I can, I can get to a running uh, application much faster. Finally, most projects have an established process for filing issues. You usually see those come up as issue templates in, in GitHub. They'll basically ask you to put in enough information so that the developers of the, the project can reproduce your problem, um, or at least do the thought experiment. If they don't have access to your specific installation, they'll, they'll understand what happened um, at each step of your install process. Um, and to illustrate, I put this slide in uh, just kind of to illustrate how software development has become a collaborative process. There's a whole bunch of people who are involved. I guess we have a color-coded slide. Uh, users, facilities, the E4S, if you're testing a package that belongs inside of E4S, 
um, the developers and kind of shared responsibilities between those. Um, so is responsibility for fixing and, and going through issues is kind of a shared concept that can go between code owners and project groups and facilities. All right, so um, after describing some of the uh, some of the importance of issue resolution and issue tracking as a way to kind of keep the, the testing process rolling, um, I'll go into four specific examples of, of ways that testing can be developed for different kinds of codes. Um, example one is, is maybe the ideal case where you are developing tests for a new code. And in that case, you are, are developing features at the same time that you're developing the tests. Um, Test-driven development says you write the test first and then you write the development. Um, regular, regular development is you know develop the, both of them at the same time, basically. Um, pretty much when you're developing a science code, you're, you're always um, exercising the functionality that you created as you're building that functionality. And so what testing does is it just, it says stop and take a minute to recognize that you already uh, tested the functionality as you developed it and save that, save the you know particular script lines that exercise that functionality as a, um, as a shell script or a Python script or a mini program that you know imports your library and runs a function. That then becomes a test, which returns a zero or a one when it's executed. And that zero or one can, you know, turn into, um, can turn into a, a much bigger way to track what's happening across different areas of your project. In the second example, um, probably at the far other end of the spectrum is testing a legacy code. Um, and this particular test example comes from uh, E3SM code, the Exascale Earth system model. And in this case, the, the challenge was to take what's illustrated here as a large code tree and to actually uh, find a way to test just a small piece of it. And so what I'm going to talk about here is, is a testing strategy that's kind of like developing a mini app. Um, for the purposes of, of this uh, example, the, the mini app is, is just some tiny piece of functionality of the code that doesn't involve the entire code tree, but involves a, the, you know, the, the critical piece that you, that you want to focus in on. Um, because this was a legacy code and there are lots of pieces, uh, there was kind of a, a difficult process of isolating a piece of code to test. Let's say that the this is, uh, say, module one and, and two functions inside of the module that you wanted to test. Um, and this piece is undergoing refactoring, which is why you, you need a really good targeted test case for it. Um, the way that the the way that the development of this kind of a test would work is to first run the, the full code and capture whatever state is injected into this piece. So maybe there's, you know, there's um, there's some functions on a grid and some parameters and, and set up information. Uh, write that state to a file and uh, take that state and create a driver that can read the saved state from the file. Now there may also be pieces of of extra uh, pieces of the code that are necessary just for the driver, um, and in this case, you start to get into this you know halfway situation where some of the code is used for the the test driver and some of the code is used for the test itself. There may also be pieces of the code like say this red dot comes from another module and there's just one helper function inside of this code that's needed to run the test um, as a dependency of the test code. Um, so you might have to make kind of shim modules um, and that. This is why the, the testing can get messy in the case of a legacy code, yet this is the strategy you kind of have to go through. Uh, once you've isolated those pieces, then you're pretty much ready to go. You have your driver read the state that was saved, and um, with the loaded state, the driver can then execute the piece of code that you're interested in. In this particular example of a, um, of a, of a testing a legacy code, what was being tested had to be run at scale on an HPC cluster in a um, in a batch queue and took about two hours to execute. But after doing this um, doing this code isolation, the developers were able to run this test in two minutes on their laptops. And so it actually provided a real tangible productivity boost for being able to refactor this piece of code. Example three is it's kind of the most involved example and it goes through um, the way that the testing frame that Anshu Dubey has has kind of incorporated uh, scaffolding as a concept in the flash code. 
Um, FLASH is a code that simulates particles and fields in astrophysics, like exploding stars. And here, the, um, the unit testing framework was developed as a series of layers that build up from basic functionality all the way up to advanced. Um, the basic functionality could be um, kind of built up, I guess maybe I'll illustrate it with, with some circles here. Um, a, a gray circle illustrates kind of a mocked up basic um, function inside of, the, inside of the testing suite, and the blue ones are using real dependencies. And so um, for this particular code, there's a, a bunch of modules that kind of have to work together for the entire thing to, to run. And if you just run all the modules together, it's tough to figure out which one the, um, the error is coming from. So the way that the way that the scaffolding concept works is actually to make uh, some sort of stand-in for the the real functionality, which you can then import um, with a module, so that the module doesn't import uh, working modules, but it imports the stand-in. And this way, you know if your um, if your test fails that it's due to the the individual module you're looking at. So as an example, we'll go back to the halo cell. So to give you more concretes on that. Um, we'll go back to the halo cells and the halo cell fill. In order to actually do a halo exchange, you need to fill your grid with data. Um, but rather than using the, the full-blown um, astrophysical data that, that the code usually works with, uh, the, the grid cell fill test was actually built with, with fake functions. So um, these functions are just standard you know, sine or cosine or something where they, they know what the function is and they fill up the grid with the function. Um, then they run the halo exchange and they can verify that, that that known function has been exchanged correctly. There's another part, another module to the code called the equation of state module, which computes things like energy as a function of volume or pressure as a function of volume. Um, and you can run the equation of state on a single grid cell. And so that equation of state test, test becomes one single module test um, that's run on its own. When you put those, when you put those two together, you're able to do um, you're able to do hydrodynamics for areas of the cell that, that now exchange information. Um, so we're putting those two together. And now we have a hydro test, which uh, the, the key point here is that because we've tested these individual components of, of the hydro code, if something fails at this point, we know that, that the failure exists in the combination of the modules. Um, you can continue on this line of thought by building things on top of hydro. So if you start to run adaptive mesh refining a AMR, um, or if you're if you're doing AMR but you're not doing dynamic right. So if you start to add dynamic refinement, which is changing the mesh structure as a function of of time, um, those start to involve more and more complex parts of the code. Um, and so if you if you run the if you structure the the, the tests in such a way that you run uh, one step at a time and only add one new component, so for example, you run the hydro code without the AMR, you can isolate the fault to the hydro code if you see a fault. Um, now you can add AMR on top of that, which will tell you whether or not the code is in AMR but not in hydro. Um, and then finally, dynamic refinement on top of these three things would tell you that a failure at this point is due to regridding. And this kind of you know, stepwise testing framework is a great way to build up layers of complexity. As a final example, um, this is less of a less of a exactly what the test does example, but more of a how to strategize around your tests. Um, this is a map of tests where, in the uh, columns, we're showing different um, different modules in the code, so adaptive mesh refinement um, or unstructured grids or multi-grids or FFT, uh, fast Fourier transforms. Um, and these different modules are exercised by different kinds of physics. And so along the, along the columns, you see different types of physics. So hydro code or, or gravity code or particle code. And what the development team did in a test strategy meeting is they actually um, you know, made this grid up and they took every one of their tests from kind of the, the simplest uh, tests all the way up through the more complex and, and stringent tests, and they wrote them all down in terms of which physics functionality and which module, which you know code functionality are we testing. Um, and the grid was able to kind of show them whether or not they got code coverage across um, the application and the the and the computer science areas that they cared about. Of course, you you might not necessarily have 
have something filled in for every combination, but that might be because that particular combination isn't uh, exercised. So this can also help guide where you document and, and where your use cases should go as well. So that's the end of the testing part of the module. And um, as a, kind of the, the takeaways that we get from this, it's important to understand that your testing strategy should be adapted to your specific testing needs and costs. Think about how your software is going to be used and its its long term strategy, and also think about you know what your what your development team wants to focus on, uh, so that you can you can get your tests up to um, the most productive they could possibly be without spending too much time on them. Devise your tests so that they're able to quickly pinpoint errors uh, and reason about your code's behavior. Think about using a range of tests, um, bottom up, uh, going from unit tests up through um, kind of up through the software stack and top down as you know integration of using your your code as a user would use it, um, and then you know drilling down into the individual parts. Also think about testing at different complexities, uh, CI versus um, versus nightly or scheduled testing. Regression testing is is slightly different. It's when you're um, it's when you're testing for a bug that was found previously to make sure that bug doesn't come back again, um, and also maintain this holistic validation strategy. Validation is a concept that that is asking uh, whether or not your code is simulating what it intended to simulate um, and doing the physics correctly. So you can also kind of bring in physics ideas to make sure that your tests are able to um, that your tests are addressing. The, the core questions that your application was intended to solve. Um, with that, I want to stop for just a minute and see if there's questions on testing before I move on to continuous integration. Okay, not hearing specific questions on that. I'll move forward to continuous integration. The CI part of this talk, uh, first I'll go through definitions of, of continuous integration, uh, kind of the the, uh, the introductory material on CI, and then I'll give you a quick outline of how you would adapt CI, what it actually looks like. It's um, it's not too difficult. There's a there's a file, and I'll show you the file. Um, and then I'll go through some examples from open projects. Uh, the way that these projects have implemented their continuous integration is is kind of an interesting uh, case to show us how how things are working there. Um, and then I'll give you some hints that I found um, that, that are just maybe shout outs to code teams and interesting things that they're doing inside their pipelines that will give you ideas uh, to help you build new functionality into your CI. And a summary that that looks at um, experiences that some of the ECP teams have had implementing CI. So first, what is continuous integration? CI is, is really, um, it's adding a check to your development cycle. The usual development cycle in a Git repository involves creating a new branch, adding some features, right, pushing some code fixes to your branch, and then merging them into um, the, the online repository version of that branch. Right? So do some local development, push it online. With continuous integration, what you're doing is you're asking um, the GitLab or GitHub server to actually run some tests for you as you push the code. So this inserts testing as a part of your development process because as you push a code change, the repository is able to uh, do an automated build and test and provide you um, feedback on what's working and what's not. You're able to iteratively push more code fixes. Um, and every time you push a code fix, your CI uh, can be triggered so that it can tell you whether or not your code fix is addressing the issue. Um, finally, you've got a branch that, that has a bunch of green checks from CI tests succeeding. And someone can review that that pull request. Your reviewers can have confidence that the tests are still working, and um, then they're able to merge it. I guess there's also deployment on this slide, but I'm not going to have a chance to get into deployment. Um, there, once the automation's up and running, you can also add more automation on the deployment side if you want to deploy releases. Um, but again, I'm going to stay away from that for now. What are the components to CI, right? So there's breaking down the word. Um, CI is obviously involving testing. Um, what you wanna do is focus your testing for CI on, on critical uh, pieces of your code. Um, you wanna make your CI tests more like unit tests and that they're fast running and that they're able to, um, 
They're able to quickly diagnose issues, things like syntax errors or, um, or type errors that happen during compilation are good things to put into your CI suite. And obviously you want them to be as orthogonal and complete as you possibly can. This can often require that you redesign or refactor your existing test suite for CI because not every test is best suited for CI. It might take too long to run or require too many resources. Um, continuous integration also contains integration, which is the idea that you're um, that you're running your your code in a way that a user would see. So you can actually um, you can download and build your your project's dependencies as part of your CI, and that could actually um, help you as a as a project understand whether changes in other levels or other uh, other parts of the software stack have impacted your code. It's also meant to be used. Um, in kind of small iterative chunks. So develop, test, merge, develop, test, merge. Um, developing small bits of code and then merging them often is much better than developing a whole lot of code and then waiting to do merges because the merges become more difficult the more code you develop. Um, continuous integration is also continuous um, and it is it's testing your code um, fairly often. So at every, at every kind of pull request or, or push of your code up to the repository. Generally, this implies a lot of automation, so you don't have to keep building your code. The uh, server can help you do that. Um, I also want to talk about documentation and test-driven development versus automated testing versus CI. These three are similar terms, but they all mean slightly different things. Um, I prefer documentation-driven development to test-driven development because it's the one that I use. Um, it's a method where the documentation is written before the code so that you can design the functional units of code and the things that your code's gonna do um, and explain them to a user before you implement them. Um, and that way you don't spend time solving implementation details that, that aren't eventually going to become relevant. Um, it can be combined with test-driven development, which is where you write your tests before you publish the code. Um, automated testing is, is a much bigger area than continuous integration. Automated testing can deal with anything that automatically performs tests on a regular basis and can reliably detect and report the behaviors and outcomes. Um, as an example, there's, there's frameworks like Autotest or C-Dash, or you can write a script pretty easily that, that exercises parts of your code and provides a summary report. Um, and those sorts of things are good for um, automated testing. Those can live next to your development workflow as, as kind of um, extra pieces that exercise your code and then store information locally. Potential issues with automated testing involve um, knowing exactly what change to your code broke the build, um, getting a result in a timely fashion, um, or dealing with multiple branches of development. Continuous integration is kind of a small subset of automated testing that's performed at high frequency and fine test granularity. It lives within your development workflow, so it happens as part of the way you develop. Um, of course, the potential issues there have to do with the fact that there's a whole lot of automation going on, which gives you um, a little bit of maintenance burden in making sure that the automation is doing its job correctly. Um, so just to give you a visual example of what these things look like, this is a picture of what a um, like an automated testing report might look like. Uh, this is one particular um, automated test runner that I think was developed with the flashed code. Again, it's a, it's a summary of different different tests that were run and what their status was, um, and these are scheduled. CI testing, you've probably seen it on uh, GitHub or GitLab, and you see that the pull request itself contains uh, information on whether or not the checks passed, as well as integrations. And I'll show that uh, what those integrations are in a second. Advantages and disadvantages that can make CI difficult. Um, common situation is just getting started and there's way too many choices out there that's, that are all in the cloud and they're, they're difficult to distinguish. Um, to get around that, start small um, and use a very simple example and build up from there. Uh, you'll find that it's not, so, it's not so bad if you just adopt one technology at a time. Um, Developing suitable tests can sometimes be difficult, especially if you have a large test suite that has many tests that aren't suitable for CI because they require um, they require GPUs or multiple CPUs or lots of time. So you might have to simplify and refactor or find a subset of tests that work well with CI as you get started with this. Ensuring sufficient coverage is important. Um, I mentioned this before. There's a tool actually, I'll show an example of in a second that will tell you um, whether or not your code coverage is increasing or decreasing. And there's actually ways to automate making sure that your code coverage of testing is increasing. Um, 
an event situations. You might have um, you might be using so-called golden file tests, which is where you run the you run your application and you produce an output file and in subsequent runs and of your application, you test to make sure that your output is similar to what the what the golden output is. Um, this can run into issues if you're looking for bit for bit matches uh, because the results of floating point additions can depend on what order you added the floats in. Um, having too many third party libraries can be a stumbling block because it will take longer to do a compile. Um, there are solutions, but they require a little bit more a little bit more work. And performance testing can also be uh, time and space limiting. So I would recommend uh, to solve uh, time and scale limited problems to also use side by side a um, a schedule testing method. Okay, so what CI is out there? Um, I'd recommend uh, getting started on GitHub or GitLab. And if you're using CI as part of your ECP project, hopefully you're already connected to a site liaison who is who is able to give you specific guidance for your computing site. Um, and there are site local resources. And there are also site local resources that are specific for ECP that work across projects and site legal re local resources that are um, that are distinct from ECP. And so, um, so it's worthwhile to spend some time deciding which kind of service you're going to use uh, to run your jobs. In kind of a graphical picture of, of how things connect, the usual setup is that you have uh, a code, well, oh, it's a typical setup, maybe not the usual setup, is that you have a code repository that sits on github.com and that when that code repository gets uh, gets updates from you, then it can contact third-party services like codecov.io. GitHub can build itself, or it can connect to uh, build farms like AWS build for farms or other CI resources. Um, you might also be able to you know, make parallel contributions to other repositories that are sitting at GitLabs or local sites, uh, or talk to uh, sites behind firewalls. <clears throat> github.com offers a whole lot of integrations uh, that will that will do something with your code and provide a result back to github and that's kind of the, the typical workflow that happens uh, so by configuring your ci file here you're able to tell it to run hooks over here um, and then see the results back on github all right so aside from the set of questions that you ask yourself that are code specific developing tests there's also a, a set of questions that are that are involved in mapping your code to ci resources and those are essentially what kind of configuration of my code do i want to focus on testing on the resources that i have and what functionality of my code do i want to use um, Oftentimes, what happens is you define specific test configurations. So there'll be one test configuration that compiles everything with GCC, and another test configuration that compiles everything with a with a different compiler. Um, the ICC and and um, other compilers might be difficult to get licenses for on testing, and so you have kind of difficulty in in getting different configurations running. Um, and so you've got to figure out which kind of configurations do I really want to invest time in getting running. There. Are, grid tests, which will run on different versions of Python. Um, these are all questions to consider as you build your tests. Um, and then good candidates to get started, uh, kind of define a pathway to increasing how much and, and where do you want to increase the complexity of your tests. So you start with the hello world um, and build up from there. Here's just graphically what these CI files look like. So if you went to GitHub, clicked on the Actions tab, you would see uh, some helpful text. I'm getting started with GitHub Actions and some template files that are giving you um, GitHub workflows test name.yml. This file itself is where you'll put all of the logic of, of downloading and compiling and reporting on the results of your code. Um, here's an example of a GitHub Actions file. It says that um, this particular this particular action is going to be called check the results. It contains information on when this uh, when this set of jobs will be run. Um, in this case, it'll be run if there's a push to the main branch or a pull request to the main branch. And then it contains a set of jobs with individual steps that um, that are basically running shell scripts. <clears throat> there are other some there are also GitHub actions which are able to do 
uh, kind of sets of commands all at once. And you can read about these GitHub actions individually. Don't worry too much about them right now. Um, but as you kind of Google for ways to do different things, you'll find actions that become involved. All right, so once you've set up uh, your, your simple tests with um, your .yml file, um, when you start to trigger those tests by doing pull requests and, and commits, you'll see a status screen that looks like this, and it tells you what each step of the job did and what its results were. Um, this green check mark happens because the test returned zero um, and there was no error discovered by the shell. If you set up a third-party integration, so in this example, I actually gave you a upload coverage shell script that uploads the results of a, of a code coverage make to CodeCov. Um, for this to work, there, there's some additional material you can find on our website, or you can Google, you can get from, from looking at CodeCov.io on how to make this work, but you essentially have to set up a, an account with CodeCov.io, and, um, and it will then find your GitHub account um, and allow you to view this kind of a dashboard on what parts of your code have been covered by your tests. And as you develop these tests and run them over time, you'll be able to kind of look through the history and see what your testing history of your code has been so that, so that in case you need to do kind of a longer term audit of when things have happened on your code, you can look back a little bit and find, um, find the history of how tests have been running. Okay, so that pretty much covers um, what I want to say about actually getting the, the tests up and running on GitHub. Obviously, there are a whole lot of details in here, but I'm, I'm just giving you the, the view from a thousand feet of set up this file, um, follow, uh, follow the documentation and, and get things working. Um, I want to spend some time talking about um, specific use cases and examples and also maybe give you some warnings on what could possibly go wrong. This is an important one to keep in mind that um, kind of the, one of the oldest tricks in the book for for web associated applications is code injection. So when you're creating workflows or actions, you should be aware that these these actions are running on your um, they're running on GitHub's resources in the default mode. They're running on GitHub's resources. Um, with actions that are associated with with you as as GitHub sees your user account, and so you always want to be considering where did the code that I'm executing come from. Um, certain contexts should be treated as untrusted input, and um, attackers could try and use those untrusted inputs to insert their own code or malicious content. So um, understanding script injections is important. I also want to put in a note on software supply chain stability and security. Um, packaging systems are there to help you install software, but they also provide an easy way to help you install software. So unless you've checked that the software that the packaging system um, is installing is good, um, you're relying on the packaging system to find vulnerabilities. Um, ideally, they would do a great job of not putting the software into the packaging system that is vulnerable, but but again, it's always falling on you to, to look at your dependencies and understand what kind of vulnerabilities might exist there. Regularly testing your dependencies can also help. And um, in fact, you can also look at uh, some CVE databases to see if there are, um, see if there are vulnerabilities and, and exploits related to uh, known vulnerabilities related to the dependencies of your projects. Um, Log4j was an example of this, where if there were a bunch of, it, it, there were a whole lot of, of uh, JavaScript codes that depended on log4j, and when a dependence, when an error was found in log4j, uh, a vulnerability was found in log4j, then every software that depended on that vulnerability now had a vulnerability that was found for it. Um, you can also use GPG signatures um, in order to sign your releases. This doesn't actually say anything about um, it doesn't stop this kind of problem from happening, but it does provide some confidence for the people who use your software that your code has not been tampered with since the time you wrote it. Um, of course, this also kind of is an implicit endorsement that you've checked that that your code is is responsible. Um, and so it kind of ties your reputation as a developer to the trustworthiness of your software. Um, lock files are another mechanism that can help you understand where all of your software is coming from. Um, 
npm make a, makes a package lock json um, ruby has a gem file spac has a spec.lock these are ways of kind of auditing the exact versions of all the dependencies that your software depends on um, and those packaging systems will create those files and people usually check them into um, usually check them into their version control system and of course they're going to be able to tell you uh, what software you're depending on. Okay, so with that, I want to go into uh, some notes we found in the community that are, are telling us about software productivity and design and, and the way that, that people use um, CI in their projects. Uh, the DCA++ team I wrote in this paragraph uh, from their application paper on why software and scientific productivity kind of come together as a pair. Uh, they say software development needs to be sustainable and scalable by producing comprehensible, maintainable, and extensible code. Um, it's essential that release changes rapidly to the users. And the scientific method depend, de demands that uh, correctness, credibility, and reproducibility of numerical results um, in your published work. And the developers believe that these methods represent a substantial factor for research code to become a long-lived software project. Case for design, we have the uh, Ginkgo team making a strong case um, saying that because it was intended to be adopted by applications, the design needed to follow the kind of modular logic that the application developers are naturally using. Um, so it was important for, for the software design of, of this Ginkgo library to be, to be very thoroughly um, understood and, and communicated to the community. I want to go through uh, a couple of a couple of documented examples of how uh, packages out there uh, like Warpex are are doing their tests. Warpex is is one that's uh, that's kind of following the the idea of running separate nightly builds and CI tests. The CI tests run on every commit, and of course, there's the pros and cons that we talked about before. They only catch what you ask for in CI. Um, the nightly builds will catch everything. Um, and they run every night, but they take longer to run and use special resources. So they have specific clusters that they run these on. Warpex is also able to use its example input files and analysis script during its tests. Ginkgo, software that I was talking about a second ago, um, actually went through the effort to, um, to create an automated performance evaluation pipeline, which they documented in this paper. Um, and significantly, they, they took a section of the paper to explain how to repurpose this framework in other projects. They've got a great figure that, that goes through kind of the steps we talked about. The developer is pushing to the repository, which is doing the builds and tests. Um, those builds and tests can then all be audited by the reviewer who decides, um, you know, provides feedback, does a discussion um, on the pull requests and merges into the code base. Um, there's a separate set of steps that that is uh, talked about in this paper here, where where a um, a scheduled a scheduled job pulls this repository and runs it to provide performance data, um, and because they were uh, able to set up a separate repository to stash that performance data, they um, they could make reports on a web application from the you know the past performance of the code, the current performance of the code, and, and comparison against different matrix sizes, etc. Um, so it's a, it's a really nice documentation, and I'm going to point it out here, but not be able to go into much more detail than that. There's also um, a joint center for satellite data assimilation. It's, uh, it's not DOE-associated as, as far as I know, but they have a large regular data processing needs, and they're associated with uh, NCAR uh, ISS. Sorry, the, the uh, UCAR NCAR um, Center for Aeronautic Research. And they have several different software packages that are part of this center that all have the same kind of, of requirements of doing data processing. So because of that economy, economy of scale, they were able to spend some time really thinking about how to design a reusable build and test pipeline. The result is worth taking a look at, especially if you're interested in containerization, uh, because they point out some specific pros and cons of different kinds of containerizations. Um, basically, their, their idea here is to write Docker files that set up common and build environments 
and then build their software in these build environments on AWS because AWS has the resources they need. Um, but then as a user, um, they want you to actually run these Docker files using Singularity or Charlie Cloud, Charlie Cloud or on your, on your laptop, they recommend Vagrant um, with Singularity and Charlie Cloud, uh, I guess because those are slightly easier and more secure than Docker. There's also um, some, some code snippets, kind of shout outs to the community that I'll go through really fast on cool ideas that I found out there looking through people's um, CI files. This one comes from DCA++, where they show kind of a nice way to use the, the, the if statements inside of, uh, inside of jobs to check whether or not your repository owner is equal to the comp views. What this will do is it will prevent people who fork their project from triggering this particular job, which means that you as a as a kind of a person who's contributing to their code base and forks their code doesn't have to run all the CI tests the same way that they do. Um, as a separate example, there's there's a lot of documentation out there on how to build inside a container. So I want to point out that it is possible to create a container in one repository and then have your, your job testing repository um, basically use this kind of syntax container colon and then a, the name of a Docker container in order to run a, a set of steps inside the container. Um, that can help you with your, with your build process if you have a lot of dependencies. Here's an example from Warpex. They actually use Ccache to cache parts of their build um, and speed up their, their builds as they're doing CI. But what I specifically thought was interesting here is that they're, um, they created a, a shell script called make easy install, which combines the, the, pack, the git package clone with the, the CMake build and install steps. Um, so rather than having four lines of kind of spaghetti code, they've just grabbed one reusable script and then run it a bunch of times. Um, here's some specifics on how to use Ccache. Um, this uses a feature of GitHub called um, GitHub Cache. Um, GitHub also has, an, has a kind of a similar functionality that's called um, artifacts. Cache and artifacts will both save information from one build to the next build. Um, and in this case, uh, the key ingredients to using Ccache are that they've used the cache functionality to save everything inside of .ccache, which is where Ccache keeps its um, compiled object files. They've installed Ccache and they've told CMake to launch Ccache as the CXX compiler launcher. There's more documentation here to, to make sure that you get all the, the details correct. Um, just one more example. Um, this one shows that it's possible to use your GitHub actions to build documentation like uh, running Sphinx build in order to make an HTML documentation page and then to deploy that documentation to GitHub as a GH pages branch. So when you do that and you browse to GitHub, um, to when you browse to the website associated with your project in GitHub, you'll actually see your documentation show up there. Uh, usually this kind of action is run um, only on the main branch and only when, uh, when you've merged a change so that you don't keep rebuilding your documentation. All right, so with that, I'm gonna do the final conclusion from this talk uh, on team experiences with CI. There were a couple of teams that that uh, the ideas uh, ECP project talked to about their implementation of CI a couple, it's kind of mid last year. And uh, the ZFP, XSMR and VISIT teams provided their kind of shared experiences here on implementing CI. All of them actually used this golden result idea, uh, taking a full program run and checking run to run, um, whether or not that golden file had changed as part of their testing. They noted that if you're developing tests, there's kind of a unique mindset of adding armor to your application that you need to have when you're building that, when you're building those tests. The most cited benefits they had for testing were identifying your potential bugs earlier and increasing your project's ability to receive community contributions. But there were also drawbacks cited, like uh, the difficulty and the, the effort required for maintaining tests. Sometimes uh, it's annoying that you have to do trial and error running the tools themselves because you might get random errors if your tools don't, because your tools are you know based in the cloud. So you might have network errors and things like that. Long running tests make testing increasingly annoying. Um, infrequent random failures, as I 
mentioned due to network uh, can be difficult to track. So rerunning the tests usually kind of gets rid of those. Um, they also noted that the implementation of these tests didn't overly disrupt their, their development process. And after overcoming the initial adoption hurdle for implementing CI, the teams started to insist on having CI available in the future. Uh, so with that, I'm going to end the tutorial on testing and CI. Are there questions? And I think this would be a convenient time for folks to unmute and ask questions verbally if they like. Uh, you can raise your hand to indicate that you have a question. All right, I'm not seeing any at the moment. Um, we are now heading into a break, a 15 minute break. So we'll resume at 4.15 Eastern. Um, we will, at least I will stick around. So if anybody uh, wants to talk about some of the material that David covered, uh, feel free to, to hang out here and we can chat, uh, or you can uh, also put questions in the chat tool. Uh, and with that, we'll see you back at uh, 4.15. Thank you very much. All right, I think it's about time to start with the second presentation in this afternoon's tutorial, which will be given by Greg Rogers. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Greg Watson. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think we're a merge of David and me. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. I'm Greg Watson um, from Oak Ridge National Lab, and I'm going to be talking about uh, improving reproducibility through better software practices. So a lot of what I'm going to touch on here um, is probably a higher level uh, than what David talked about, but there'll be some a little bit of overlap, uh, particularly in some of the testing areas. But I'm going to be talking about it from a reproducibility point of view rather than the low level, like how you actually do these things. Um, so just this is the license uh, page. OK, so um, we're going to be talking about reproducibility and uh, replicability, um, but there's a lot of terms um, that are sort of used when talking about this these topics. Um, so you'll hear uh, reliability, correctness, accuracy, transparency, and so forth. Um, and they they all have specific meanings, um, but really uh, the differences don't matter so much uh, for this presentation. Um, we're going to really be talking mainly about the first two, although some of the other uh, some of the other uh, words will come up uh, during the, the presentation. Um, just one little note on the first two: uh, reproducible versus replicable. Um, so historically, um, different communities, uh, you know. Uh, scientific communities versus uh, computer science versus computational science and so forth have had different meanings for these two terms. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as uh, issues with reproducibility um, have sort of become more topical, um, there's been an, uh, an effort to try and sort of reconcile uh, what these terms mean. Um, and it's uh, there's, a, there's a consensus now, I think, that's uh, reasonably uh, um, universal, which is essentially um, both terms are used to describe uh, trying to obtain the same result or consistent results, uh, uh, you know, uh, on someone else's work, um, but... Um, uh, reproducible refers to using the author's experimental environment. So uh, taking a, an environment or whatever the experimental uh, setup is and using that uh, to try and uh, produce the same result. Whereas uh, replicable is more about trying to obtain consistent results, but using a, a different experimental environment. So there, there's sort of subtle differences. Um, and in some senses, replicable is, a, I think, is a, a stronger uh, result. Um, but we're we're pretty much going to just use these interchangeably in in, in this presentation. 
Um, so why is uh, reproducibility important? Um, so I'm going to just go through a couple of um, examples of, of issues that have occurred. Um, so this was a, um, a, an article that was published in the New York Times in 2015. Um, a, um, a, a group basically took 100 social science studies that had been done and, and tried to reproduce them. And they were unable to reproduce about 60 of those 100 uh, studies. Um, the studies were published in three different journals. Um, so, um, you know, if you look at the whole, uh, at that whole uh, set of studies, uh, really the efficacy of those studies was reduced to less than 50%. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this really highlighted that uh, some of the findings uh, that, are, that are being published perhaps aren't as strong um, as, as are being claimed by people. Another example um, in the computational science area was uh, related to the behavior of water um, just above this uh, hom homogeneous nucleation temperature of minus 40 Celsius. Um, there was a study published uh, by Deb and Adetti in, 20, in 2009, uh, which uh, determined that there were two possible phases, a high density phase and a low density phase. Um, then um, another paper came out that was published in uh, Nature, I believe, um, uh, by Chandler in 2011, which found only one phase, uh, a high density phase. Um, and I think the, uh, uh, the De Benedetti people obviously were, were pretty puzzled about why, um, you know, a, a completely different result was obtained. Um, and um, so they, and, and basically they looked at the paper that was published in Nature, um, which uh, stated that the, um, the LAMPS code, which was used uh, to, to produce the results, um, had basically they just used the standard uh, uh, version of the code and that the scripts that they used were, you know, freely available upon request. When they actually went and requested those uh, uh, scripts, it turned out to be more difficult to obtain them. And eventually it, re it required a number of different requests and, and an appeal to nature to actually get the, uh, to get the code uh, that was used to generate the results. But they finally did get the, the, the results and, uh, sorry, the code, and they um, uh, not surprisingly found a bug in the uh, code that was used to produce the second set of results. And what had happened was that the Berkeley people had um, modified the LAMPS code to speed up the execution of it. And when they went back to the original LAMPS code, they found that um, the results were similar to the original paper. Um, and that resolution took about seven years. Um, and you know, presumably other papers and other science, other researchers had uh, seen the second result and maybe, um, you know, that had influenced their, their own research. Um, but the interesting uh, conclusion that they drew was that basically um, there's no way that the Berkeley's algorithm really could have been re re uh, reproduced um, from just reading their paper because their paper had stated that they just used the standard uh, LAMPS code um, and had not documented the, uh, the changes that they'd made. Um, so that was a, a pretty uh, interesting result. Um, a, uh, another example was uh, related to uh, Python scripts. Um, so there was a bunch of scripts that were used to analyze this uh, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance data. Um, the scripts relied on uh, Python's glob module. Um, for, and for people that aren't familiar with that, globbing is the ability to um, match file names using patterns. So using asterisks and question marks and so forth, you can uh, create various patterns that allows you to 
uh, match file names and, and these file names presumably these files contain the, uh, the data that was used for the experiment. Um, it turned out that the, the GLOB module um, ordered the results differently, uh, depending on whether you're running on Linux or Mac. Um, and due to presumably some uh, issues with the uh, floating point representation or some other issues with the algorithm, um, the results change depending on which order the files were processed in. And uh, this essentially cast out on 150 papers, uh, which is a pretty massive, um, uh, you know, problem uh, when you consider uh, how much uh, work had gone into this and what the potential impact of, 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 the, um, of this problem could have been. Um, and there's a link there if you want to go on and follow and uh, take a look a closer look at that particular incident. So there's a few examples of uh, of essentially why reproducibility is important. Um, and you know essentially uh, the takeaway is that if you're using computing uh, for science, then really the science itself is only as credible as the software that produces it. Um, and so focusing on the software uh, can be as important as ensuring that the science itself as, uh, you know, is, is reproducible and um, of high quality. So uh, what I wanna talk a little bit more about as we proceed through this module uh, is um, essentially how we can uh, help, uh, you know, improving the, the culture of reproducibility. Um, what are things that we can do to try and avoid some of the issues that, um, you know, have been highlighted in those examples? Um, so one of the things that is pretty common is that, um, you know, people are focused on the science they're trying to, uh, trying to achieve. They would like to do a better job on the software, um, but there's all those pressures, you know, to get papers submitted, to complete tasks uh, that are required for milestones. Um, you know, they're being told that they need to produce certain uh, outcomes in their research and so forth. And there's a lot of pressure to focus on that rather than on the software. And uh, what we need to really do is try and change that culture in, and think of ways to incentivize people to uh, value the software uh, as much as the science, because, you know, if, if the science isn't good, then the, uh, if the software isn't good, then the science isn't good. Um, so there is a motivation for, for improving the software, um, but um, it can be hard to, uh, you know, to do that if the culture is not focused on it. I think there are, we're starting to see some changes in organizations um, towards a more uh, software uh, focus, but um, I think we've still got a long way to go. Another issue is that uh, the uh, resources that people use in computational science, um, such as, uh, you know, supercomputers or other specialized hardware, these are all scarce resources and um, trying to run multiple simulations to in order to be confident of your run uh, that you that the data that you're generating from your runs uh, um, um, is is accurate um, is not something you necessarily want to do um, you have a you have a precious allocation of these resources you really want to try and uh, restrict what you're doing to just running it, uh, running the simulations or whatever it is to uh, produce the, the results um, that you can use. Um, but, you know, often you need to uh, spend time uh, running multiple simulations in order to be more confident in the results. And there are a lot of people that rely on that, apart from yourself and, um, you know, perhaps the PI sponsors, uh, reviewers. Um, people that are reading the papers. 
um, and other scientists who are going to be using the results of your research. So um, there's a lot of people that need to have that confidence. So we need to figure out ways of uh, building that uh, level of credibility and that confidence uh, without just uh, consuming those resources. Um, another thing that's been happening um, are that uh, funders are starting to, funding agencies are starting to be um, more stringent about how you deal with your data. And we're seeing that uh, data management plans are becoming much more common. Um, most sponsors now require some kind of uh, data management plan as part of uh, proposals. Um, the NS NSF had the policy on uh, dissemination and sharing of research results. Uh, OSCA have uh, data management plans as part of their uh, FOAs and so forth. So that's starting to become uh, much more prevalent. Um, most of these plans are based on these fair data principles. Um, and there's a link there you can go to if you're not familiar with those. Um, but um, Essentially, the fair data principles are about uh, making your data available and maximizing the ability of, of researchers to access your data um, and locate that data, um, obtain the data and be able to you know, reuse that data or use that data to uh, verify and reproduce your results. Um, so that's, that's something that's becoming a, a much more prevalent uh, fact that um, other things that we're seeing are uh, these initiatives um, that through through conferences and through uh, journals. So one thing that's um, been happening for a few years now uh, is the uh, SC Conference Reproducibility Initiative. So that's the supercomputing conference series. Um, now have uh, two appendices that. Um, can be attached to uh, to your uh, your submissions, your paper submissions. One of them is mandatory. So this artifact description dependency is now uh, mandatory. Um, it's largely auto-generated from the information that you submit, um, but it, it does provide uh, some additional information about um, the experiment, how you set up the experiment, um, and how you go about uh, rerunning computations, for example, um, in the future, um, if you want to try and reproduce those results. Um, that artifact description is evaluated by reviewers. Um, there's an optional appendix, the artifact evaluation appendix, um, which provides uh, uh, much more detail about um, the environment that you used. Um, particularly if you're using some sort of esoteric hardware or software environments. Um, and it goes into a lot more details about, you know, how someone would go about trying to uh, evaluate um, the, uh, the data that you've created and reproduce an experiment, for example. Um, that is still op uh, optional. Um, and there is a review uh, process for that as well. I've, I've uh, been involved in that myself, and I can tell you that uh, it's quite difficult to uh, really effectively describe, um, you know, how to reproduce a, uh, a particular outcome, particularly in these, uh, you know, if you're using sort of uh, custom hardware or supercomputing facilities and that kind of thing. So that can still be quite difficult to do. Um, but if you're interested in more details about these two um, uh, appendices that are part of this initiative, there's a link there for that. We're also seeing publishers um, pay a lot more attention to reproducibility, um, not just in computing, actually, but um, in many scientific disciplines. Um, but uh, there's some examples here. There's the uh, ACM replicated computational results. So if we're interchanging replicated with reproducible, um, then we can use that terminology as well. Um, that's part of the uh, transactions on mathematical software. There's a link there. Um, ACM also have a badging um, scheme that 
provides badges for um, uh, you know how functional, uh, reusable, available, and whether the uh, the data is uh, and and the uh, experiment can be replicated or reproduced. And um, so they have these different levels of badges um, that you can you can achieve depending on what you provide in addition to the paper. And there's a link to that. And there's a bunch of other uh, conferences that have also started doing this kind of thing. Um, and another link there, that uh, that second link is uh, available. There's a bunch of useful resources if you want to take a look at that. Uh, the NISO, uh, NISO have also um, set up a committee on reproducibility and badging. I think it was set up in 2019. They, they put out a report in 2021 that provides some recommendations on standardizing badging. Um, it's pretty close to what the ACM badging um, scheme is. Uh, and it's not surprising because ACM was part of the uh, part of that committee, uh, as well as some other organizations. But um, that uh, that report's available. I, I think that committee is still um, it's still working on this and um, uh, is looking at taking feedback from that original report and producing um, you know better uh, better standards in this area. Um, so this is a little bit more detail on the uh, uh, the Tom's uh, uh, reproducible computational results. Um, so uh, you can select this as a as an option. Um, and it doesn't change uh, the way the standard reviewing happens, but there is a, an RCR reviewer assignment, um, and that happens concurrently with the, the normal paper reviews. Um, and uh, basically, the process, I think, is fairly similar to the, the SC one as well, uh, where they're looking at um, you know, how well you can reproduce those results. Um, once the once the, this is accepted and the publication goes out, there is a, a there is a designation on the publication about um, being uh, RCR compliant. Um, there's also an acknowledgement uh, for the uh, the reviewer, um, and the review report appears in that in the published man manuscript. And there's a, you know, this is sort of a win-win situation for uh, for everyone involved. So it certainly increases the uh, the credibility of the papers that are, that get published um, if they've had this additional, uh, you know, review. The authors get to, um, you know, talk about the badging they've they've achieved and also the. Uh, quality of their results and so forth, and the reviewer gets a companion publication. So it kind of works for everybody. Um, ultimately, though, what we're trying to do here is um, improve, you know, the transparency of what goes into uh, the research um, and improve the reproducibility of that of that re, uh, that, that research. And that, but you know, doing that really requires um, improving the the quality and the sustainability of the the software that underpins that science. So there is this kind of uh, demand cycle, demand uh, virtual virtuous cycle, where um, the the improved productivity enables that uh, transparency and reproducibility, but it also requires that aspect of it. Um, so these two things uh, kind of work together to hopefully create a, a, a better and more sustainable environment um, for uh, the science. So now I'm going to talk about um, some of the ways to um, improve reproducibility. And, and I think uh, this is where there's a little bit of overlap with what David was talking about earlier. Um, but I'm going to stick to fairly high level um, here. And I'm going to talk about um, some different um, 
different aspects of when you can um, focus on on improving reproducibility. So, uh, first of all, I'm going to start with uh, during development. Um, so, as you're developing the software, um, there's some uh, fairly basic things that uh, can help to uh, to really improve the overall reproducibility, and probably the most uh, the most basic one is versioning. Um, so ensuring that the code and the documentation and other artifacts are under the control of, of some kind of version control system. Um, and then, you know, making sure that as you modify that code, the, uh, the uh, version control system is, is uh, taking care of those changes and, and uh, keeping commits and so forth. Um, the versioning information then becomes uh, really important um, as a way of identifying, you know, which which code or which uh, particular uh, set of code produced a particular output. Um, there's some issues about version numbering. There's many different ways to uh, create these versions. So there's what's called the semantic versioning, where you're uh, you're creating some meaning uh, in the version numbers itself. Um, that can cause some issues if you want to know when to change the versions. Um, some version control systems automatically generate identifiers such as commit hashes um, that uh, can be um, useful in different ways, but maybe not as meaningful because there's no there's no kind of semantics associated with those hashes. Um, so they may not be as useful as, as say, semantic versioning. Um, and, um, and one thing that, you know, you can, uh, that's really important to kind of understand is whether the code that you're working on um, and that you're using to generate your scientific results um, is the same as the one in the, in the repository. Um, uh, or is it a modified version of the one in, in the repository? So that's, again, why versioning is really important. Another thing is to um, that versioning helps with is, is keeping the documentation in sync with the code. Um, typically, you know, people forget about the documentation, um, but if it's version controlled as well, then that can help to try and keep these things in sync. So versioning is definitely a very uh, fundamental part of the reproducibility equation. Another um, thing that's, that should be thought about is building in the quality from the start. Um, so there's a, a number of software engineering practices that can be used to um, improve the quality. So things like coding standards um, uh, are important. Um, and there's a number of different standards out there that are available that depending on, on what your code base is. But for example, Python uh, has coding standards that uh, you can follow that you know, ensure that your code is, uh, is, is readable and um, sustainable. Um, so these are not just necessarily coding styles, but um, they, uh, they have other expectations in terms of uh, how the code is written and the documentation and the tests and so forth. Testing is obviously really important and, and David talked a lot about that. Um, it's important to make sure that, you know, you have tests and the best time to really write the tests is as you're doing the code. There is a methodology called test-driven development where uh, you write the tests before the code and then you write the code to pass those tests. Um, that methodology is pretty widely used in software engineering circles, but less so in, uh, in sort of scientific computing, because often what you're doing is very experimental um, and it can be hard to think what the test might be before you're actually writing the code. So if that, if that doesn't work, then um, at least writing the tests as soon as possible after the code um, to make sure that you really, st you still think about it and you understand what you're trying to test. Another factor is that uh, the code typically starts off being 
less public, you know, uh, there might only be one person, the scientist working on the code, or there might just be a small team. But as the code becomes more public or is, is more widely used, then the testing needs to become more rigorous. And um, obviously there, you need to balance the, uh, the cost of, of doing that testing, writing those tests uh, with the, um, the risk uh, associated with that. Um, but that's something that needs to happen typically more frequently um, as, the, as the software becomes more widely disseminated. Um, another, another practice that can be done is code reviews. Um, a lot of the, uh, the platforms that you, you can use for doing version control like GitHub and GitLab and so forth um, have very good um, code review mechanisms built into them. Um, that allow you to to essentially do code reviews um, every time you commit new code. Um, so that is definitely something that you know people can easily take uh, take advantage of. Um, there's other ways to uh, help with code reviews, such as pairing um, uh, coders with less experienced coders. Um, and so forth. But uh, code reviewing is definitely, uh, you know, a, a practice that should be undertaken. Um, and a third aspect to look at during development is, is understanding the numerical aspects of your code. And, you know, this is particularly important for scientific computing because, you know, we're dealing with, um, with a lot of math and, and physics. Um, but it's important to remember that floating point numbers are really just an approximation to real numbers. Um, and um, that means that the results that you get are going to be approximations to the real results. And this can introduce lots of different issues. Um, for example, you might be using uh, different precisions. Um, some, uh, some systems reduce the precisions to in increase performance. Um, so it can, you know, be really important to make sure that uh, that the results you're getting are, are comparable to full precision versions. There's a lot of non-determinism that can come in through uh, using floating point numbers uh, because of those approximations, particularly um, where there's concurrency, um, because uh, the calculations done in different order may uh, yield different results. Um, there might be options to force uh, more determinism by serializing what you're doing. Um, but, you know, these are factors that definitely need to be considered um, as part of uh, the whole reproducibility effort. Um, knowing the error bounds and developing tests. Um, most facilities, uh, you know, high performance computing facilities typically have experts that can help with these uh, types of issues. And so uh, they, they're good things to take advantage of. Um, after the development has taken place, then you know really it's testing, testing, and more testing. Um, there's many different types of tests. There's uh, uh, regression tests, for example, um, which help you identify bugs that might creep back in um, or new bugs that, uh, you know, may be introduced into the code. Um, you can think about uh, different types of tests that you might be, uh, might be able to do, such as corner cases, um, intentional or unintentional misuses of, of the code um, and other, other strategies, you know, really to try and do as much testing as possible. Um, another thing to think about are third-party dependencies. Um, and a classic example is this is this globbing issue, right? Um, are there tests that can be added to uh, test those dependencies? Um, how can you test if the dependencies change? You know, is that going to impact on the results? Um, how do you know that your tests themselves are, are even working um, properly? So one thing that you can do is, is deliberately introduce problems and make sure the tests fail when they're supposed to fail or, or that they pick up failures uh, like they're supposed to. 
Um, so that can be something that's typically overlooked uh, when people are developing tests. Um, so, you know, strategies such as ensuring that the code uh, does what it's intended to do um, and on different platforms because different compilers, different uh, libraries and so forth uh, can impact on, on the code itself. And ensuring that you test regularly, so preferably through some kind of automated testing system and uh, you know, using continuous integration and the other features that uh, are provided by platforms like uh, GitHub are definitely worth taking advantage of. Um, some of, sometimes it's worth thinking of um, the actual model itself and how you might be able to um, take advantage of, of what it is that you're doing to uh, structure tests. So particular properties about um, the math or invariances, for example, or conservation rules or other things that um, are going on in the physics that you know, you know should, uh, should hold um, that you could add tests for. So these are... Um, uh, you know, good strategies for scientific computing if you really understand the, the models at that level of detail and can think of, uh, of tests that would make sense. Um, another uh, slight digression on testing is um, this notion of design by contract programming. So here, um, what you're doing is really trying to build testing into your your methods or your functions. Um, and this, this uh, computer science approach of design by contract um, is a fairly um, formal way of defining, you know, what a particular routine should do. Um, so the way, uh, typically the way it works is creating this uh, contract between the caller and the callee, the routine, um, by defining a set of preconditions which essentially, uh, you know, what input is expected uh, for that particular routine, a set of post conditions. Um, so what does the, uh, the function, you know, guarantee at the end? Uh, so, uh, you know, what, what are the results that, it are, that it's producing? And then uh, uh, there may be invariance as well. So what things are unchanged at the, at the end of the routine? Um, so given, you know, a set of valid inputs, in other words, the preconditions are satisfied um, and the routine should generate or guarantee this valid set of outputs um, that the post conditions are satisfied and these invariants are maintained. And typically what happens if these, if these conditions are not satisfied, um, then there should be some error raised at that point. So essentially the routine is testing, the, the testing is built into the routine as, itself by testing these preconditions and postconditions and invariants. Um, and, and so this could be uh, something that you might want to think about um, when you're developing the code as a way of um, complementing, um, you know, the, the testing that you're providing. Okay, so that's sort of on the coding side. Then if we think about the experimental side, um, what can you do to improve um, reproducibility? So thinking about, you know, what you're really going to do, why you're doing it and how you're, how you're going to do it um, is definitely an important place to start. Um, so planning your experiments. Um, so if you're in a team, designating one person as the coordinator of the experiment, um, know what uh, the code requirements are, the inputs and the outputs um, that you're trying to generate or, or analyze are, um, know how you're going to process or analyze those results, um, know what to expect in terms of um, the results and how long it's going to take and uh, how much uh, resource it's going to use and so forth. And then ultimately, um, how you're going to ensure that the results are trustworthy. So these are all things to think about, you know, prior to um, or during the experiment. 
Um, you can also perform um, some pilot runs or test runs on uh, smaller scales to sort of build your own confidence in terms of the correctness, how well it's going to perform um, and how and what the impact of the scaling is going to be. Um, and then you can also think about the uh, the results and the, that are going to be generated and how you're going to store and or analyze those, um, what resources that you're going to need, um, how you're going to ar archive those results, bearing in mind that you probably now have a data management plan, which is going to require some kind of preservation of, uh, of the data. Um, it's going to need to be made available, be findable, and so forth. Um, so those things need to be thought about and uh, paid attention to. Another thing you can think about is um, how you might uh, reproduce what you've done. And not only that, think about how you might do the same thing in three years time, you know, bearing in mind that in that time, things like the operating systems, uh, you know, the hardware, the, uh, the libraries and all sorts of things may change. Um, so that is going to, uh, you know, cause a, uh, uh, potentially cause a lot of difficulty in reproducing the code. Um, so things like we talked about earlier, um, making sure we you use well-defined versions of the code, um, such as, you know, releases um, that you've created or that are sort of official or that you've tagged at least. Uh, rather than relying on just uh, the head of a particular branch, which could be changing, um, ensuring that you capture the exact version of the code that was used um, uh, for the experiment, not changing uh, versions during a series of experiments. Um, sometimes that's that you need to do that, but um, you know it's preferable if you don't have to do that. Um, and if you do have to change versions, then you know knowing exactly what changed um, and capturing exactly which version was used for each experiment. Um, trying to ensure that uh, you're only uh, using versions of the code that have been thoroughly verified, um, continuing to use regular testing, um, particularly to identify changes that may happen to the underlying platform and the hardware and the compilers and so forth that may have changed over time. Um, and, tr and you know, trying to capture that information and create, uh, you know, that uh, uh, provenance in terms of the libraries and compilers and other, other dependencies. Not often done, but, um, you know, if you want to uh, submit a, uh, one of those appendices to supercomputing, then um, that's the sort of information that you would need to provide. Um, so provenance, as I mentioned, um, involves the code, the inputs and the outputs, um, and then essentially what you've done. So keeping that provenance or as much as you possibly can um, will help uh, not only in the reproducibility, but also in, you know, uh, submitting papers to journals that uh, require or provide uh, badging or other types of reproducibility goals. Um, so capturing the co code versions we've talked about, um, capturing all the inputs and configuration information for every experiment, um, and doing that in a way uh, that's redundant, you know, so have multiple systems um, that will allow you to correctly associate the inputs and the outputs and the code versions. Um, so, for example, some systematic directory and file naming conventions, keeping written notebooks or electronic notebooks um, that records that information. Another good way to retain that information is scripting things. Um, so the scripts not only help you automate um, or simplify the the running of the experiment, but also um, document the steps necessary. You can then version and, and 
keep uh, keep those scripts um, along with the code and the other information, the other artifacts that you have. And then version controlling the data too, if, if that's possible, depending on the size of it. Uh, once the experiments uh, so, um, are completed, um, we talked about scripting. Um, so scripting is much of the analysis and the reduction steps. So this is after the experiments have been undertaken. Um, there's provenance, you know, that uh, can be captured to document how you've done the analysis and and all the reduction or whatever it is that you do with the data um, to produce the final results that then ultimately get published. So scripting those things, again, is a way of not only simplifying it, but also uh, documenting, and then uh, you can version control those scripts uh, documenting the uh, the process as well, um, so that's separate from the scripts, but through electronic notebooks or paper, if you really want to do it that way, not so useful these days. Um, uh, another thing to think about is the intermediates in the uh, reduction and analysis process. So, do they need to be kept? Um, are they important for the overall experiment um, and how you analyze the data? Um, and then capturing the data, particularly the data that's used to produce the graphs and the tables. So sometimes what can happen is that we get the data from the experiment, we then do some kind of analysis and reduction on it um, that produces more data, which then is used to create the graphs using uh, tools maybe Excel or something like that, but then that data gets thrown away um, and it can be very difficult to reproduce that data. So keeping that as well um, is, uh, is important and would probably form part of your data management plan if you had one. Um, okay, so uh, that they're the a number of different, uh, I guess, ideas about um, how to um, improve your reproducibility at the coding stage and then at the experimental stage. Um, some some uh, tools that might help with this as well. There are many, many tools out there. And I talked about some of the sort of basic ones, you know, like versioning control and so forth. Um, but there are some other uh, uh, ideas about how to improve reproducibility. Um, one is uh, to use containers. Um, containers can be a way of capturing your environment as well as the software. Um, and so that can definitely help with the, um, uh, with the reproducibility aspect. And in fact, um, I think uh, in this, the SC um, uh, artifact um, uh, appendices, uh, they they really encourage people to use containers, and it certainly makes it a lot easier to for someone to reproduce the results of the experiment. It doesn't solve the one hundred percent of the problems because you still have may need some kind of exotic hardware or something, but um, it certainly makes it a lot easier to get to the point where you can actually even just run the software in the first place. Um, there's some tools uh, there uh, for understanding and debugging floating point math problems. Um, that's a good resource uh, if you're doing a lot of floating points and, and you haven't really thought about issues to do with, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the inaccuracies uh, introduced by uh, floating point math. Um, there's uh, some platforms out there to help uh, for publishing and reproducing research data and code such as Code Ocean, um, there's digital object identifiers and hosting of data and code and documents. Um, there's a number of different sites out there now um, that are available uh, for, for minting those DOIs and also for hosting the, uh, the data and the code. Um, so there's a lot of resources out there. We've provided some links to them, but uh, I'm sure you can find other ones as well.
Um, okay, so to summarize what I've talked about in this module is really that um, it comes down to um, the credibility of the science that you're and the science results um, boils down to, you know, how much you can trust the code um, and ultimately the process that you've used to create that code. Um, that's really the fundamental thing. Um, it's it's great to see that stakeholders, um, so funding agencies and, and other stakeholders are now beginning to become more aware of, of the importance of this and are, you know, increasing their expectations, uh, particularly through things like the data management plans um, that are now required by many funding agencies. Um, there's a lot of strategies to improve reproducibility, um, both during the development phase um, and during the experimental phase. And we talked about some of those things. That's not an exhausting, exhausted list by any stretch of the imagination. So, um, you know, there's definitely other things that you could do um, if you're really wanting to drill more into um, improving code quality. Um, and, and reliability and ensuring that, um, you know, the trust is there in your, in your software. But essentially, really, they, this all boils down to um, better software development practices. Um, and these are the same practices in, in a lot of ways that are uh, advocated for improving productivity, improving the sustainability of software, um, the maintainability of the software and so forth. These are practices really that have been employed by um, the software engineering industry um, for a long time, but really haven't had widespread adoption in the scientific community, in the scientific computing community. Um, and so it's not like we're trying to uh, invent new things here. There may be why it may be necessary to adapt some of these things to the way we do uh, scientific computing, but um, they're essentially the same ideas, and we're really just taking these things that are tried and true and you and using them uh, for scientific computing. Um, so this is a list of uh, some additional resources if you're wanting more information on fair. Um, there's a number of working groups. Uh, that are involved in um, uh, FAIR and also FAIR for research software. Um, the TOMS, um, uh, uh, there's, there's some uh, more information that you can look at there. Um, reproducibility for computational methods. Um, and then, um, you know, some other resources there uh, for helping you really understand more about reproducibility um, and, um, you know, the floating point aspect of that as well. Okay, and with that, I'm going to stop here and um, open it up to any questions. Thanks very much, Craig. And um, I think it'd be a good time for people to unmute if they want to ask a question or go ahead and put it in the chat, whichever you prefer. Everybody's got reproducibility down pat, eh? <laughs> Maybe everybody at, at, uh, at ACP. Well, yeah, it would be nice to hope. All right. Well, if you think of questions as we're going along, uh, you can put them in the chat and Greg will be around and I'm sure he can answer them or you can uh, contact us by email later. Um, and can I, I guess a quick question. Sure. I'm sorry, I have trouble unmuting. Um, uh, no problem. Uh, perhaps you already mentioned this, but um, you know, there's a distinction between reproducibility, repeatability, and I think there's a third one, I don't recall which one, um, that uh, we often get confused with. Could you elaborate a little bit on the differences and when we need each? So let me just go back to that slide. Um, <clears throat> I 
Um, where are we? Actually, it's right at the beginning. Um, so the two, the, the, the sort of distinction between these uh, two terms is that um, reproducible, re reproducible refers to obtaining the same result uh, using an experimental environment that the authors used in their paper or their, uh, their scientific results. Um, so that would be something, um, perhaps, uh, for example, you're a reviewer in, uh, on the SC um, conference or, you know, um, the ACM, something like that, and you're trying to verify that, um, you know, the results that the authors claim are, are correct, you know, and that you can reproduce those. So that would be a typical example of when you would uh, use that methodology. Replicable, I see more as I'm a scientist, you know, I'm working in a similar area and I, I want to uh, recreate the results of uh, another scientific experiment, but I want to do that on my own terms. I want to do it on my own um, equipment and I want to establish that I'm able to do that uh, with my experimental environment and that my results are going to be consistent with uh, with another, you know, uh, result. So they, they would be the two distinctions as I see them. Okay, thank you. Um, Other questions for Greg? Sorry. William, William also put another resource in the, in this chat. Thank you, William. Oh yeah. Well, thank you, Greg, for your presentation. All right. Any other questions for Greg? I I, I do have a question actually, um, and uh, it's going to be a softball. Don't worry, Greg. So <laughs> it's um, you know we're in in the era of uh, AI, machine learning, you know. Uh, low precision. How how can we tackle that? You know, from this perspective, right? Reproducibility meaning like, oh no, I trained the model better. I cannot reproduce what I had before, right? Or there's new data coming in. We know better. Or we have a, a new experiment and the calibration made it impossible to reproduce. How you know? There are different corners. So what's your perspective? Yes. I don't know. I mean, I don't really know. I'd be interested to hear your take on it because I. I mean, I don't work in in AI, so I don't know what the what that space are doing in this area. But I, I think it's very difficult uh, for exactly the reasons that you outline. Um, and a lot of a lot of the time, people don't even really know how their models work. Um, you know, they just tweak them until they get something that produces a better result. Um, and I think that makes reproducibility very difficult. Right. Yeah, there, there's, uh, uh, I attended many sessions, not many, but a few sessions in supercomputing. They talk about approximate computing, right? AC, which is, I don't know, if it, to me, it's an orthogonal concept, right? Like, it's trying to be very, very loose on the, uh, you know, accuracy. And that can uh, have implications to reproducibility. That, I I think those are just uh, topics to think about more from the research perspective, right? I don't know. I have two thoughts on this issue. Uh, this is David Rogers. I'm um, on one hand, you've got new architectures and platforms that are coming out with lower precision and at much larger scale. Uh, and at those large scales, the probability for errors is higher. On the other hand, um, so with those systems with higher probabilities for errors, what what we're thinking is that algorithms like AI or like like iterative refinement algorithms that that have an objective they can compute and move towards are are more robust to some of those errors, so that specific kinds of algorithms are better suited to scaling up to possibly noisy compute equipment and smaller precisions, et cetera. On the other hand, there it's a completely different issue. There's um, 
there are tools that try and help you manage the complexity of AI training, which is a special kind of complexity because you have you have input data which may change over time, and you have have built up model parameters which are also changing in the course of the experiment and, and may be based on the history of trained parameters that stretches back in different directions. Um, so there are there are tools like uh, DVC that try and address that. Um, but it's not an easy thing to address. And I think Google wrote a paper called um, the AI, the, the high interest credit card of technical debt. I, I think machine learning in particular is an area where there's still a lot of exploration and development going on in how to make those um, methods more easily reproducible. Other questions for Greg? All right, thanks very much, Greg. I think we'll move on to the final presentation, and which happens to be me. So I will share my screen and full screen. Come on, and turn on my video. Hopefully, yeah, uh, hopefully the sun's not too bad behind me. I can't, uh, can't block that anymore. All right, so now uh, we wanna talk a little bit about lab notebooks in the context of uh, computationally based sciences. So um, I wanna ask people a few questions as I get this started. So please go find your uh, the reactions control in Zoom and find the raise hand button. And I'm curious first, um, how many of you have already had some kind of exposure to lab notebooks, maybe classic uh, lab notebooks uh, on paper, uh, maybe as part of a uh, experience that people have already had. So we just lost a few. your audio for a brief second there, but it came back. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, my computer is complaining a little bit. Um, okay, so just a few. Well, I want to get us started on the same page uh, with a, a, a very minimal definition of a lab notebook. This comes from Howard Canary in a document called Writing the Lab no Laboratory Notebook, which he wrote for the American Chemical Society. Um, and he says, the goal of keeping the lab notebook is to write enough detail and clarity that another scientist could pick up the notebook at some time in the future and repeat the work based on the written descriptions and make the same observations that were originally recorded. If this guideline is followed, even the original author will be able to understand the notes when looking back on them after a considerable time has passed. So you can see that um, in concept, the lab notebook has a lot to do with the discussion we just had about reproducibility. And one key element of the lab notebook is really for your future self to help you uh, go back and uh, understand what you did a few weeks ago, a few months ago, a few years ago. Uh, but also it's a tool uh, to share with colleagues and um, things like that. And we'll explore as we go through this a little bit, uh, some of the ways that um, uh, lab notebooks can be useful. So, um, but I do wanna um, talk about, so oftentimes people think of lab notebooks as uh, something in an experimental laboratory uh, and they don't think about it when you're doing computational work. But um, a number of people have, um, you know, sort of called out that this is, this is something that's equally useful and important for computational science and, and computing in general. So Carlo Graziani is a computational scientist at Argonne National Lab, and he wrote a blog post on the uh, bssw.io site called HPC and the Lab Manager. Uh, there's a link to it there. Um, and he says, scientific HPC is several young fields that on close examination have not really stabilized or optimized their collaborative processes 
in a manner analogous to those of more mature classical sciences. As a consequence, valuable science is often needlessly lost or left uncollected. So Carlo's pointing out that uh, computing and computationally based sciences uh, tend to be less mature in their scientific process than traditional science approaches. And um, as a result, we may not be as productive scientifically as we could be because we haven't sort of learned these lessons about how to um, you know, properly collect and track all the data and information and things like that that are involved in our work. And then uh, Catherine Riley, who's the Director of Science at the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, said in uh, 2019 at the Atpesk Summer School in a presentation there, she said, practicing the scientific method properly requires good software practices. This is understood in the experimental community, or I would say the equivalent of good software practices, is understood in the experimental computer, uh, community. But computational science has had a historic problem with it. But as we can see, she says, it's getting better, which is a positive note. But it uh, suggests that there is a lot of room for improvement. And I would say that um, based on the number of people who raised their hand during my first question, um, there's probably you know, maybe a significant room for improvement in our community. Um, so I wanna step back a little bit and, and um, talk about some terminology that we're gonna use uh, and to help think about what lab notebooks are and, and what we want to do with them. And that's uh, this uh, suite of terms, data, information, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. They're often abbreviated in the communities that study these things as D-I-K-U-W. Um, and they can be envisioned in this pyramid. Um, oftentimes it, it seems that understanding gets left out when people draw these pyramids. Um, but this is a classification scheme um, that allows us to uh, talk about words that we use commonly, but with more specific meanings to them. Uh, and so we wanna, we wanna talk a little bit about those specific meanings for the purpose of these discussions. So when we're referring to data as a term, we mean a, a, a collection of information of numbers, symbols, text, things like that. It has value to us only because it's recorded. Somebody's gone to the trouble to write it down, basically. And, and an example of data might be a time series representation of temperature, relative humidity, and precipitation readings at your home. Um, now, information is sort of the next stage. That's facts gleaned from data that's been collected. So information answers questions such as who, what, where, when, how much, how long, and things like that. And an example of information that we might glean from this um, data we talked about in the first case might be um, starting at 2 p.m., the temperature dropped by five degrees over 15 minutes, and at 2.05, it started to rain, and we got a quarter inch of rain over the next 30 minutes. Right, so that's an example of information that's been extracted from data. <clears throat> uh, and then to knowledge, knowledge is derived from information, experience, and understanding. Uh, we'll talk about understanding in a moment, uh, but an understanding or, or a, a piece of knowledge that we might uh, extract from the information and the data we've collected is that relative humidity levels, when relative humidity levels are high and the temperature drops substantially, there's an increasing probability of precipitation. So that's putting together the data and um, the information that we've gleaned from that data and generalizing uh, to, uh, to some kind of knowledge. And then understanding requires um, a, a deeper ability to explain uh, explaining the why of things. And so uh, if I were a meteorologist, which I'm not, and I don't even play one on television, um, I might be able to explain to you how the atmosphere works to uh, substantiate the knowledge that we discussed before, that when humidity levels are high and the temperature drops, we'll have an increasing probability of precipitation. And I'm gonna leave out wisdom in these discussions because that's even a level above. And so Albert Einstein said uh, many cogent things. One of the things he said was any fool can know, 
The point is to understand, but is understanding really always the ultimate goal? Are there times when mere knowledge is sufficient? Um, and I would say, yes, there are many times when knowledge is sufficient. I don't need to understand the atmospheric science or the weather prediction uh, to know, uh, just to, to have the basic knowledge of whether I should take my umbrella with me when I go out this afternoon. Um, and really, these things all go together. Data, information, and knowledge are key ingredients in developing understanding. We need to be able to manage, collect, and manage all of these things appropriately to um, their role in the scientific enterprise. So if you think about what we do in the scientific context, you'll realize that a lot of um, even what appears in papers um, is about um, gleaning information. So if you're writing a paper on some particular experiments, whether they be numerical or laboratory experiments, um, you're often gleaning information, you're gleaning facts, and you and your colleagues in the scientific community start putting those things together, and you may generate knowledge out of that. And then ultimately, hopefully, um, as a community, um, understanding will be achieved. You'll be able to explain why you're seeing these things. And that's sort of the scientific process uh, in a sense. So we come now to knowledge management, right? So we want to be able to recognize when we generate knowledge, we wanna be able to capture and preserve that knowledge and we wanna be able to communicate that knowledge. And as a, a scientist or you know somebody working in a science uh, or technical discipline, it's useful to, to think about knowledge management. And it's especially useful in a computational setting because there is so much that we do in a computational setting. There is um, data all over the place and, and um, how we extract information and things like that is um, all tied up in the software that we write. Um, and so <clears throat> all these things, tie together and we want to be able to um, manage the knowledge appropriately. But is the communication of knowledge only about communicating to others? And I would say, no, it's not. Uh, one example is just a lesson learned. We live through an experience and we wanna derive some lessons learned from that. And that in first order is us uh, basically telling uh, our future selves, gaining some knowledge for our future selves to help us grow or improve or avoid some uh, difficulty in the future. And hopefully this kind of thing will contribute to understanding over time. Um, and oftentimes, uh, especially in a scientific context, we work together with our colleagues to derive lessons learned. So we create more knowledge or higher quality knowledge by working together, sharing information we've gleaned and, and um, developing uh, knowledge and communicating that. Um, and so, you know, how do we communicate the lessons that we learn to others? Well, we produce documentation in many cases. And there's a lot of different forms of documentation that we work with every day in the kind of work that we do. Um, this diagram shows um, uh, sort of a hierarchy of different kinds of documentation. So at the bottom of the hierarchy, we tend to have things that are um, you know, voluminous and dirty and noisy. Uh, and they may be dispersed in many different locations. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that are often changing, you know, on a daily basis. And as we go up the hierarchy, we are uh, sort of filtering or refining things, sorry. Um, we are um, making things more concise uh, and we have a slightly longer cadence. Right, so, or, well, we have longer cadences uh, and typically as we go up the hierarchy, the cadences stretch out even further, right? So you probably get hundreds of emails a day or Slack messages or, or things like that. Um, issues may live for days or weeks or, or months, things like that. Um, uh, documentation gets updated as you, you know, hopefully gets updated as you change the code, may happen every few months, things like that. Um, and then you pull together all these kinds of things, your um, computational experiments and things like that. And you might write some tech reports. You might give some talks. 
Um, and ultimately, you'll probably write some journal articles, right? And these are um, these have maybe the longest cadence of the kinds of ways we document our knowledge and communicate it. Um, they're the most formal. They're the most concise compared to what goes into them, all the work you've done to build up everything that goes into your journal article. Um, and so, you know, basically, if you look at this hierarchy, there's lots of different kinds of documentation, which starts with what amounts to data on the bottom and works its way up and, and hopefully uh, becomes knowledge and contributes to understanding. Some of these documents that we produce are intentionally frozen at creation. Others are living documents which get updated over time. And so just as a classic example, usually a journal article is frozen when it's published. Um, an email is frozen when it's sent, but you can send more emails, you know, things like that. Um, and so you see that in this world that we live in, these are all kinds of different digital systems. Um, most of us don't do any of this stuff on paper anymore, I think. And so you see we have a lot of different systems that we're working with, and, and this makes it hard to um, manage all these things, right? And, and it complicates our lives in some sense. How do we manage the data and the information and the knowledge that uh, we engage with on a, on a daily basis? Um, lab notebooks are meant to be a way to help with some of this. So lab notebooks are considered to be a fundamental part of communication, as well as a fundamental part of rigorous reproducible science, right? They're in experimental laboratories, they're commonplace, and, and they're, they're oftentimes required. Um, as a national laboratory employee, I, one of my onboarding things 23 years ago was about lab notebooks, you know, how to keep a lab notebook, where to go get the next lab notebook when it gets filled up, obligations to archive the lab notebook and, and things like that, right? But these days, um, uh, as laboratories, even experimental laboratories are increasingly automated, um, lab notebooks are changing in form. So um, oftentimes you'll have, even in an experimental laboratory, you'll have laboratory information management systems which are connected to the instruments. And so the data gets collected and it automatically goes into the LIM system and then things like that. So, um, so you have already these digital streams, even in experimental laboratories, which you have to worry about. Um, laboratory notebooks are also a tool for preventing scientific fraud, and they can be a legal tool, for example, for um, defending patents and things like that. And I spent uh, a couple of summers as an intern at Amico Research uh, when I was an undergraduate, and one of the first things they talked about there, uh, once again in the onboarding, was the importance of uh, keeping a laboratory notebook. In that case, it was a written notebook and, and they talked about how to do that. And you were supposed to have a colleague uh, every day, you were supposed to go to a colleague and have them read through what you'd written in the notebook and sign that, that they you know read and understood what was there as well. And for a company like Amico, this was an important thing if they um, wanted to claim a patent or had to defend patent rights or, or things like that. So the concept of lab notebooks is that they should be used regularly. They should be comprehensive documents. They should not be filtered. You don't need perfect grammar or full sentences or things like that. Uh, the lab notebook is meant to be frozen at creation. So if you know it's it's okay if you have mistakes, um, you just sort of um, put a line through it so that it's clear that it's you're making a correction, but that you can see what was there underneath the line still. Uh, so you don't scribble it out or white it out or things like that. Um, and um, hopefully uh, for to be more useful, the lab notebook should contain more than just the data you collect. That's maybe the least important thing for a lab notebook. You want the lab notebook to really talk more about your um, your reasoning your motivation for, for doing certain things, the conclusions that you came to, why you think you should do this as a next step, things like that, right? So lab notebooks aren't necessarily good at communicating knowledge because they're dirty and they're not filtered and they're, um, 
they're messy, but they're also a very useful tool for uh, people to uh, interact and collaborate and even you know, collaborating in some sense with your future self by keeping a, a good set of laboratory notes so that you can go back and understand or remember what you did and why. And um, also, as we'll see, keeping uh, a form of laboratory, laboratory notebook can help you develop procedures so that you can sort of do things more systematically and uh, maybe eventually automate them once you understand uh, the procedures that you need to use to, to get something get something done. And so we go back to um, this blog article that Carlo Graziani wrote. Um, and he observed that as researchers progress in their careers, they typically deal with problems that become uh, larger and more complex. And you know, they're, they're, you're going through and you're trying to do computational experiments and things become larger and more complex. And the techniques that you had figured out to manage the data and information and things that you're producing start to fail. Um, and you have the sense that you're missing some data or you're having problems. Um, and Carlo likened it to doing in-flight air airplane repair, trying to sort of fix up your methodology as you're trying to do this experiment and you're under a deadline and, and all this kind of stuff. But uh, over time, you find that you invent processes and tools to compensate for these problems that you're finding. And what Carlo observed was every time he did this, he eventually reached the point where he had reinvented the lab notebook. And he'd done this you know, several times, different, different experiences. Um, and, and essentially what he found was that he was uh, in fact reinventing what people in experimental laboratories recognize as a lab notebook. And so let's think about um, some more you know, systematic ways to go about this. But one of the challenges is that nobody likes writing lab notebooks. It's like writing documentation, right? This made up quote says, lab notebooks are a waste of time. I write notes, but I never use them. Um, and that's kind of the attitude that a lot of people come to lab notebooks with. Um, and really, this is um, an attitude that comes from a lack of experience and awareness. Because um, until you've actually made use of lab notebooks and, and had good lab notes to work with and made use of them, um, you're not going to appreciate these things. But good notes are implicit for communication and um, sharing experiences with your collaborators. Um, as I mentioned before, good notes can be turned into procedures as you start doing things uh, a couple of times. You sort of refine your techniques, and then you can figure out, OK, this is the recipe to do this. Um, I oftentimes turn these things into checklists. So I have, for example, um, you know, when I'm doing, when I'm when I'm preparing this tutorial, I've kept notes about all the steps that I have to go through, uh, and then I turn them into checklists that I can actually put in a template for a GitHub issue. And all of a sudden, you know, I have um, something that guides me right through everything I need to do to publish everything for one of these tutorials. Um, another important thing about lab notes is that they become more useful as time passes, right? Um, right away, you remember what you were doing, um, but over time, your memory fades. So it can take a while before you would actually see the benefit of going back to your own lab notebook and, and sort of reviewing things. Um, but as our lives get busier and we get uh, pulled in more different directions, you also see that lab notebooks um, can become useful even, you know, because you, you set something you, you do some work and then you have to set it down for a while and work on something else and then you want to go back to it and you need to remind yourself what you were doing right um and another thing to think about um to you know sort of moderate your feeling that lab notes are a waste of time is to recognize that writing lab notes but not needing to read them is actually a good thing Lab notes are most useful when something's gone wrong, right? Or you, you know, so it's it's not necessarily terrible that you're writing notes and and not going back to them for a while, but it is actually kind of a useful exercise to try to make sure you're um, producing good notes for yourself and for your colleagues. So let's just take a, a quick look at what um, some 
poor uh, lab notes and some better lab notes might look like, right? And so on the left, this is a, a, a lab note entry that's not so useful. I came in on Monday at 9.05. I started working on study ABC. Um, late in the day, I, I got lots of interesting data and I put the results in this GCE file system. And I don't give any details about what I found or um, any details even about where the files are. They're just somewhere in this file system, right? That's not going to be very useful for me when I go back you know, a month later and need to pick up the study again and remember what I did, or if I want to talk to my colleagues about, you know, why I'm having problems with something or what what they're, if they're part of uh, the study as well, to explain to them what I did so they can pick up uh, where I left off. And on the right side, you can see maybe a, a better approach to taking these notes. So Monday, um, starting at 9.05, I was continuing to work on study ABC, and I'm helping myself by reminding myself that the last time I was working on this was July 7th. Um, the, the, the theory that I'm currently working on is that if A happens, then B must also happen, and here's how I'm going to verify this. Uh, uh, I start doing some experiments on our cluster BBOP. Uh, I note here what uh, compiler I used to um, build the code, that I based it on a clean commit out of the repository. Uh, and that's, for those who don't know, that's a get commit hash. Um, I built using a script and I, I saved the um, log of that build to this particular file so that I can go back and look at it and review it. Um, I, I note here that there were no warnings or errors omitted during this build process. And that's important in a couple of ways. One is that it just tells me that I looked at the log file and I actually confirmed that there were no errors, right? But it also, you know, for example, if you're sharing this with a colleague or um, you have collaborators who are also involved in this study, you know, it, it clues them that maybe they should be looking at the build logs and looking for errors and things like that. That's maybe something, uh, especially if they're less experienced, that may be something that they hadn't thought about before. Uh, and then I used this job script and I gave the name of the, the job script um, and the ID of the run and things like that. And I said where I saved the outputs of the run. And then I talk about how I analyzed the data that came out, um, I named the script and I saved the results, say where I say, um, save the results. And then I look at this data and I note in my notebook that I don't see a peak around one and a half MV, MEV, which means that this theory that if A happens and B must also happen is wrong. So, um, but now I have a new theory. So I believe now that if A happens, then C must also happen. And I can go through and do an experiment to um, verify or falsify that, right? And so you can imagine that the set of notes on the right, they may take more time to, um, to write out pretty obviously, but you can also hopefully imagine how much more useful they would be. And if it's another month before I get a chance to work on this particular study, or if I need to hand it off to a colleague uh, to do some, uh, to, to finish some results or a grad student who's working with me or something like that, right? They're gonna have a much easier time with the information on the right than with the information on the left. So this is kind of, you know, the beginning to see what a lab notebook can provide and how it can be useful. How do we want to keep a lab notebook <clears throat> in this day and age? Well, um, there's an argument that says nothing beats good old pen and paper. Um, so in, in an article in Nature about how to pick an electronic laboratory notebook, um, Roberta Kwok said, since at least the 1990s, articles on technology have predicted the imminent and widespread adoption of electronic laboratory notebooks by researchers, but it has yet to happen, um, although, more and more scientists are taking the plunge. And this is really true. Electronic laboratory notebooks used to be a research topic. DOE even funded some research into electronic laboratory notebooks. And there are a number of laboratories had um, uh, prototype systems and things like that. And I will say that what uh, ORNL and to my knowledge, a lot of the other labs 
uh, now support as officially approved electronic notebooks that follow the archiving requirements and things like that um, are very different from those experiments back in, in my case, this was early 2000s or so. Um, pen and paper has a, a lot of pros and it's kind of the reference that um, you, know, you need to think about when you're um, thinking about how to keep a lab notebook. So you can use a pen and paper in almost any situation. Uh, the format is very open, so you can put in there whatever you want. You can easily draw diagrams or annotate things, you know, um, whatever. Um, and it allows you to concentrate on the work rather than the tooling. And oftentimes you find that um, note taking is actually useful because it slows down your progress a little bit and it gets you to think more carefully about what you're doing so the process you know sl the slowing down and the process of taking notes itself um, helps you think about things a little more and do a, a, a more thoughtful job of your work and then typically um, a paper notebook is stored um, in a public location next to where it's used. So if there's a lab notebook associated with an instrument, it's oftentimes right there on the same table or um, right next to the instrument so that people can make notes about um, how they're using the instrument and how it's behaving and calibration information and things like that. Um, or if it's your personal lab notebook, um, it's probably on the shelf right above your desk or something like that, or maybe sitting on your desk. And um, on the other hand, electronic lab notebooks um, have challenges, right? So they can be um, tied to technology that can fail. Um, there are a lot of different possible solutions out there with different pros and cons, and nobody has time to choose uh, to uh, evaluate uh, all these different options. Um, there is oftentimes uncertainty about the future of a tool. So are you going to, um, you know, are you going to be able to, uh, is it going to have uh, a, the lifetime that you expect? Um, are, how are the costs going to go? Will you be able to afford it? Um, will you have the ability, if you need to move to a different notebook tool, will you have the ability to export your um, uh, the notes you've already taken and put them into another uh, different tool? And then, you know, there's other concerns about um, how the funding or how um, access control rules or things like that uh, might restrict how digital uh, notes can be stored and, and things like stored and shared and things like that. So it's so a lot of challenges with electronic notebooks, but um, we, do, um, we do computing and we don't, um, we, we do that online, right? We're, we're doing, we're not really um, using paper very much these days. So we need the equivalent of a lab notebook that lives in the context in which we're working. So we're going to look for something that is online. Um, we want to um, think about how to make our notebooks public in appropriate ways. So we want to be able to share them with our collaborators, for example, uh, or with, with colleagues who might want to, um, might be able to give us advice or with junior colleagues to help educate them. Um, and so, um, you know, do we um, do we need different types of notebooks, and and how should we think about these different notebooks? Um, and then, how can we use automation to overcome some of the challenges of getting information into the notebooks and dealing with multiple notebooks and things like that, and actually increase our productivity? And um, so, one way of thinking about this in the computing context is we probably have many different streams of lab notes. We don't necessarily have to have everything in one single place, uh, and it can actually be more convenient to sort of keep the information uh, closer to where it's used, and that may lead us to several streams. So let's look at some of those different streams. Um, we want to um, capture things about our scientific instrument, which is our software. So we wanna be able to uh, capture information about the code itself. We wanna capture information about the software environment uh, in which the code is being run. We wanna capture information about how that software is built and, how, and the job files that executed and things like that. Uh, we wanna keep track of information about our data analysis. Um, we want to, you know, we're doing 
computational experiments, which may be um, fairly complex and, and long running. And we need to track uh, information about how and why we designed those experiments and how we executed them and what we um, got out of the results. And so the right tool for the job is probably not some single 10,000 line file um, sitting in one particular location, but rather a, a, a set of things that are associated with the different aspects of the work that we're doing. So let's think about what some of those streams might look like. Um, a lot of us use Git to version control our software. And so there's a set of lab notes that go with how you're developing and testing that software. And here's an example of um, a, a Git commit message that talks about, um, tries to, to enrich the changes that you're making to the code. So you can look at the, the diff of the actual code. Um, and, and that's one thing, but um, you can use the commit messages to capture information that's not obvious from the diff, right? So the first paragraph here talks about um, what, what this commit tries to do and why, it talks about um, references the um, unit test architecture and the user manual, which is the sort of the um, structure trying to follow and um, mentions that it's likely going to impact this other set of unit tests. Uh, and so he's talking about the motivation and the reasoning and potential consequences of this commit. And these are things that aren't going to be evident, immediately evident from looking at the code diff itself. And then the second paragraph here provides some notes on how this commit, how this change was tested. Right, so some pretty specific information to help somebody gain confidence that this was actual, actually correct. Um, and we'll talk about um, pull requests in a moment as, as kind of an extension of this. So a pull request is kind of, you can treat that as kind of a filtered notebook entry. So a pull request has, uh, is an aggregation of commits to a Git repo and um, you can access all those individual commits and read their commit messages and things like that. And hopefully those commit messages are good. So what might you wanna think about doing in a pull request? Because a pull request also gives you a separate place from all those individual commits uh, to make some addition, provide some additional information, right? So the, the PR description um, is a place that you can sort of pull out some of the key information um, so that somebody doesn't have to necessarily read every commit message closely. And it, it kind of allows you to summarize things at an appropriate level for uh, the context in which you're submitting the PR. So say that this PR is um, you know, a change to the code that you've been working on and it's you know, taken you a, a couple of days of effort and you carried it out over a week. And um, so there's a bunch of commits that are probably uh, included in this pull request. Um, and, and so what you wanna capture in the pull request is really the process that you carried out and the process of testing that you carried out, right? So, so again, uh, you know, the high level of why you're doing this pull request and um, the testing processes that you use to give confidence in it. And if you use the same format for other pull requests, you can copy it from an older pull request and you can uh, use that as a starting point and then adapt it uh, to what you actually did this time. So you, you um, have a reference point for how you did it last time. Uh, and then maybe you can improve the process. And over you know, several pull requests of a similar nature, you're starting to converge on a procedure, right? Um, and this pull request description can be kind of filtered compared to the individual commit messages so that the reviewer who's looking at your code to check it over um, is not overwhelmed. And all this is going to help organize um, the effort that you're making and uh, help you design proper tests for the change that you, you wanna make. It also has some additional benefits. So if you want someone more senior, more experienced to look at your 
uh, pull request and provide feedback or suggest improvements. Um, giving them this summary actually, you know, has it, it helps them because it focuses their attention and gives them a sense of what you did and why you did it, uh, and, and is um, a concise way to represent things. They can still dig into details in the commit messages and in the diffs if they need to, but this, you know, provides a, kind of a high level overview. Um, and you can also hand this to somebody, <clears throat> excuse me, who's less experienced, um, and they can see how you were thinking about things and how you go about um, designing the tests and the processes that you're using, and maybe they'll pick up some things um, uh, and use them in their own experience. And so here's uh, just an example from a real commit that follows this approach. Um, this is working on a particular compute node in the GCE cluster. Um, he's included the modules that were loaded. So he knows something, uh, so we know something about the software environment in which he was working um, and um, talked about um, the testing that he did, all these different tests uh, and um, confirmed that everything was as expected. And now somebody can look over this and, and um, decide whether they're satisfied with all this testing or maybe something was missed or maybe they need to dig in to more details to help understand what's going on. So another kind of stream of uh, lab notes that might be useful is um, readme. So if you're familiar with GitHub, GitHub and GitLab uh, readme files, you can um, set them up in Markdown and they render quite nicely uh, at the when you open a, a repo. Uh, on the website and um, you can use uh, a readme file. So say you've got um, a repository in which you're using, uh, you're tracking a computational experiment that you're doing or you're managing uh, a, a software installation environment. Um, you can use the readme as a living document to kind of um, look at, uh, provide others in uh, or your future self with kind of summaries of what's going on and why you're making decisions and things like that. So it can provide kind of a, um, a, a, a laboratory notebook stream that um, adapts to the particular kinds of things you're doing with it. So here's a high level uh, readme, kind of a sketch of something that might go at the top of a repository where you're managing um, a particular computational experiment. Um, so it includes a summary of the experiment uh, of what's in this repository the goals of this experiment, um, how you're organizing things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, sorry. Um, or um, in a different context, this is kind of a lower level readme. This repository is uh, being used to manage a software installation. And this is making notes about a particular software tool that's part of that installation called Amrex. And so here's different dates when versions were built, um, information about where the version originated, so a repository or a branch and uh, a, a commit, sorry, git commit hash, uh, some notes about that build and how it was tested uh, so that you're comfortable with the software. Uh, these are dependencies for another code, right? And so you wanna make sure that they're working as expected. And so each time um, a new version was built, then information about that and, and how and why it was done and how it was tested is captured in this readme. Um, and this gets to uh, another point, which is that we, in computational experiments, we deal with obviously a lot of data and um, we also um, importantly want to capture the context in which we're working and metadata associated with that data. Um, and this is an important aspect, not only for the scientific process, but to help us understand um, what we've done and uh, all the details and make it more reproducible. So these are the kinds of things you want to automate as much as possible. So for example, if you have a, a script to manage your builds, um, it can help you collect the date of the build, the user that did the build, the system name, the Git hashes you were using, the configuration data, things like that. And um, you know, you can you can build these things into your tools 
um, and you can you know make sure your um, both your build and your jobs start by dumping out the modules. You might want to dump out the output of LDD to see exactly which libraries are satisfying your dependencies. Um, if you're not building something that's uh, straight out of a repository, then you might want to make sure you know what the differences in the uh, code are from the nearest commit that's in a repository. You can capture the environment variables uh, that, that appear in your environment as well. All these kinds of things, these can be automated. This goes back to the, some of the reproducibility stuff that, that Greg talked about. Uh, and then with um, a little bit of extra tooling, depending on how you're um, managing your lab notebook data streams, um, you might be able to um, sort of suck these things into your, your lab notebook streams uh, fairly automatically as well. And then one last thing to talk about here is um, Jupyter Notebooks. So um, I probably many of you are familiar or at least heard of Jupyter Notebooks. And um, this is kind of an up and coming tool. Um, they allow you to put um, a lot of context and metadata next to the data. Um, so you can have, you know, you can have text and you can capture your high level design and your motivation in, in usual text form. You can also have, um, you know, data in there or, um, you know, processing simple processing scripts or visualizations. You can comment on the results that you're seeing and things like that. And um, so this may be um, uh, uh, you know, another way of approaching lab notebooks that is worth thinking about. Um, these are, you know, there are people who are thinking more these days about um, versioning, you know, version control and the reproducibility of Jupyter notebooks because they do have some uh, challenges inherent, but, but this may be, this is kind of an up and coming tool or at least a concept uh, that may provide us some better, more useful way of approaching uh, some of this lab notebook kind of documentation in the future. And so uh, we've covered a lot of different ideas. Um, the essential thing I think is for um, a lot of computational work, you should probably be thinking about some kind of virtual lab notebook that's composed of multiple streams of information and knowledge that's captured in different places close to where it's created. So we want to design things that are uh, that make these lab notes easy to create and maintain so that we can concentrate more on executing the work and less on documenting it. And we wanna make it easy to find what you need. Um, we wanna have a, a clear identity for each stream. We want to avoid duplication, unnecessary duplication, um, and you know try to make sure that you're recording uh, the right information and using the right tools to do the job. And overall, um, this implies the need for not just you know a document, a lab notebook, but for a scheme to collect and capture um, all of this information that appears uh, most naturally in different places and things like that. So um, you really want to think about designing your lab notebook uh, as part of your overall execution environment in which you do your work, uh, your development work, your computational experiments, and, and the whole process, right? So develop um, something that works for you and your team that fits together with the way that you do these things um, and make that your lab notebook. And it's not necessarily the kind of thing that's um, you know set in stone and, and never changes once you get a set of tools, but um, as you try things out and you get more comfortable, um, you will oftentimes find that um, certain ways work pretty well for you and you can use them uh, again and again as you go through and do different projects and, and things like that. So to summarize, um, you know, software best practices are foundational to science and, and are mandatory. And by the same token, um, we also need to think about managing the knowledge that's contained in the software, around the software, in the um, uh, environments in which we do the computational experiments and things like that. Um, not all of these documents are alike, not all lab notebooks are alike, but we really 
need to have some concept of lab notebooks, even in computationally based science. Um, there's a lot of positives to lab notebooks. They allow for learning, they allow for collaboration, um, and they um, can actually make you more productive. It's uh, not an easy thing to see how to construct these in this day and age in a, a computationally uh, intensive, software intensive kind of world, um, but it's worth thinking about and it's worth putting some effort into uh, and building them into the environment in which you do your work and, and make them sort of fit as naturally as possible. And so just to wrap up, I wanted to point out a few resources um, on the right side of this slide are just some of the links that appeared in the um, talk itself. On the left side are some um, other um, resources that you might find useful. This talk actually originated uh, from my colleague, Jared O'Neill, who's a um, computational scientist at Argonne National Laboratory. And he did um, the first incarnation of this was at the Atpesk Summer School in 2022. Um, and so, uh, and, and then he did a webinar in December under the best practices for HPC software developers webinar series. And we actually have recordings of those if you're interested in hearing Jared talk about these things. Um, Jared has a little bit different perspective on this. He comes uh, from originally a, an experimental physics background and then transitioned later on into computing. And so he uh, and laboratory notebooks were very important in his experimental experience. And he's been trying to understand um, how to do the same kind of thing in the computational settings that he's been working in. So you can hear him talk about these um, if you want with those recordings. Um, other people are working on tools that um, do some of these provide these kind of execution environments that we mentioned. So um, Hopper is a tool from Ivo Jimenez, who is a 2018 BSSW fellow in our first class of BSSW fellows. Uh, the Flash project, which is something that Jared has uh, is contributing to right now. Um, somebody else involved in the, the Flash project, um, Aaron Lettner at George Washington University developed something called Flash Kit which is a tool particularly designed for um, Flash, to work with Flash. Um, Code Ocean, which was also mentioned in Greg's talk, is uh, an, an environment for publishing code and, and um, data and being able to reproduce numerical experiments. And then something we mentioned in the chat um, after Greg's talk was also weights and biases, which is a, an environment particularly focusing on the needs of machine learning. And these are, um, once again, far from the only things out there, they're just a few examples of things that you might want to look at and um, consider when you're trying to design, uh, figure out what will work for you. And with that, uh, I've reached the end of the presentation. I'm happy to uh, take any questions that you may have or we can discuss things. Questions, comments, questions about anything you've heard this afternoon, or also uh, feedback is also welcome. I think we lost a, quite a few people. Yeah. It's getting pretty late on the East Coast anyway. It is getting pretty late. But we still have a few diehards here. Yep. Thank you for sticking around. Any questions? Did any of this, did this uh, material talking about lab notebooks resonate with folks at all? David seemed to like it. All right then, I think we'll call it a day. Thank you all very much and um, we will post the, the slides are already up and the recording will be up if you want to go back to it. Um, probably maybe sometime next week, depends on when we get the re recording out of Zoom. And uh, thank you very much for spending some time with us. Please feel free to reach back out. If you have any questions or comments, we, we welcome your feedback. Thank you. <laughs>